Ignition we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One, zero, and lift off. And mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and has come to a final stop. Bei den Vorwahlen in South Carolina triumphierte der erzkonservative Newt Gingrich mit 40 Prozent der Stimmen deutlich gegen den Favoriten Mitt Romney. Aus South Carolina berichtet Carsten Mierke. Newt can win, ruft die Masse. Und wir gewinnen kann der eigentlich längst abgeschriebene Newt Gingrich. Wir berufen uns wieder auf die Gründungsväter unseres Amerikas, während Obama auf linke Spinner und Sozialismus setzt. Doch Amerikas rechte Volkspartei ist zerstrittener denn je. In der dritten Vorwahl jetzt der dritte Sieger. Der schwerreligiöse Außenseiter Santorum gewann Iowa, der Multimillionär Romney New Hampshire und jetzt Gingrich. Dabei sah sich der moderate Romney noch bis Wochenmitte eigentlich schon als sicherer Herausforderer von Präsident Obama. Zumal Ende der Woche Gingrichs zweite Ex-Frau auch noch detailliert über dessen eheliche Verfehlungen auspackte. Er betrug mich in unserem Washingtoner Schlafzimmer. Doch der erfahrene Politprofi kontert mit einer Attacke auf die großen US-Medien. Sie tun das doch nur, um Obama zu schützen und uns schlecht zu machen. Sowas kommt an bei den konservativen Südstaatlern, zumal seine damalige Affäre und jetzt dritte Ehefrau zusätzlich mit niedlichen Kindern posiert. Und solche TV-Spots derweil die Drecksarbeit am Gegner erledigen. Konkurrent Romney wird hier als geldgierige Heuschrecke dargestellt. Wer reiche Freunde einzelner Kandidaten finanzieren diese Spots über sogenannte Super -Packs. Das sind legale, aber unregulierte Spendenvereine. Und das wird sich fortsetzen. Nach dem großen und unerwarteten Erfolg hier von Newt Gingrich ist das Rennen wieder offen. Der konservative, schlachterprobte, aber charakterlich angreifbare Gingrich gegen den moderaten Multimillionär Mitt Romney, dem viele nachsagen, er sei politisch ein Wendehals. Noch neun Tage bis zur nächsten Vorwahl, dann in Florida. Gingrich macht seit 30 Jahren Politik. Einst hatte ihn seine Partei verstoßen, weil er zu radikal war. Doch jetzt ist er der Hoffnungsträger der Erzkonservativen, inszeniert sich als nationaler Retter. Wenn Sie wollen, dass Ihre Kinder vom Staat und von Essensmarken leben, ist Ihr Kandidat Barack Obama. Wenn Sie wollen, dass Ihre Kinder nicht abhängig sind, dann bin ich Ihr Kandidat. Mit dieser Botschaft holen wir überall Stimmen. Gingrich gibt den Anwalt des kleinen Mannes. Ein Problem für ihn, Mitt Romney, den großen Verlierer des Abends. Sein Reichtum wurde ihm zum Verhängnis. Seine Gegner machten aus dem Wirtschaftsmann einen Jobkiller, der weniger Steuern zahlt als der Durchschnitt. Der Präsident spaltet das Land und zettelt den Klassenkampf an. Er attackiert die Wirtschaft, die Amerika stark machte. Wir können Obama nicht mit einem Kandidaten schlagen, der das freie Unternehmertum angreift. Den Republikanern droht jetzt ein langer, schmutziger Wahlkampf. Ein Duell Newt Gingrich gegen Mitt Romney. Eigentlich wollen sie Obama besiegen, aber zurzeit ist die Partei tief zerstritten. Tja, und wofür stehen die Männer, die Präsident Obama herausfordern wollen? Porträts der Kandidaten finden Sie im Internet bei heute.de. Jetzt steht fest, dass, das, dass bei der Havarie der Costa Concordia mindestens ein Deutscher ums Leben gekommen ist. Der Mann gehört zu den acht Opfern, die bisher identifiziert wurden. Heute konnte eine weitere Tote geborgen werden. Aber noch immer suchen die Taucher nach mehr als 20 Vermissten. Als am Nachmittag der Hubschrauber lange über dem Wrack stand, zeichnete sich ab, was später offiziell bestätigt wurde. Eine weitere Tote war gefunden. Auch der Gottesdienst heute Morgen in Giglio stand ganz im Zeichen des Schiffsunglücks. Angehörige und Einheimische gedachten der Opfer und beteten für die Vermissten. In der Kirche Utensilien, die die Schiffbrüchigen mit an Land gebracht hatten. Das alles weckte Emotionen. Mir gibt das einen Stich ins Herz. Ich denke an die armen Menschen an Bord und das kleine Mädchen, weil ich einen Enkel in ihrem Alter habe. Ich hoffe, dass sie in den Himmel kommen und der Herr sie ins Paradies führt.
Die Taucher suchten den ganzen Tag nach den Vermissten, nicht weil sie erwarten, jetzt noch Überlebende zu finden, sondern weil sie den Angehörigen die Gewissheit geben wollen, wirklich alles getan zu haben. Und der Fund am Nachmittag scheint sie zu bestätigen. Von den Geborgenen konnten bislang acht identifiziert werden, sieben Männer und eine Frau, vier Franzosen, ein Italiener, ein Ungar, ein Deutscher und ein Spanier. Bislang hieß es, die Suche müsse abgeschlossen sein, bevor das Abpumpen des Öls beginnt. Deshalb läuft der holländischen Spezialfirma die Zeit davon. So wird jetzt nach einer Lösung gesucht, beide Arbeiten parallel laufen lassen zu können. Im Heck des havarierten Kreuzfahrtschiffes Costa Concordia ist eine weitere Leiche gefunden worden. Damit erhöhte sich die Zahl der Toten auf mindestens 13. Unter den acht identifizierten Opfern befindet sich auch ein Mann aus Deutschland, so der zuständige Polizeichef. Den ganzen Tag wurde im Wrack des gekenterten Schiffes nach weiteren Vermissten gesucht. Viele Angehörige haben die Hoffnung noch nicht aufgegeben, dass ihre Verwandten und Freunde noch lebend gefunden werden. Liebeskummer gebeutelt werden. Da hat Laura Decker mit Wind und Wellen auf hoher See gekämpft. Mit 14 Jahren ist die Schülerin zu ihrer umstrittenen Weltumsegelung aufgebrochen. Mit 16 ist sie gestern Abend zurückgekehrt. Familie und Freunde haben Laura auf der Karibikinsel St. Martin empfangen. Friede Gutmann berichtet. Es ist geschafft. Nach 518 Tagen und 27.000 Seemeilen läuft Laura Decker mit ihrem knallroten Segelboot Guppi auf der Karibikinsel St. Martin ein. Fast schüchtern wirkt die jüngste Weltumseglerin angesichts der vielen Zuschauer. Die rotzfreche Göre ist zu einem nachdenklichen Teenager gereift. Klar gab es Momente, wo ich gedacht habe, was um Himmels Willen machst du hier eigentlich draußen? Aber ich wollte nie aufgeben, es ist ein Traum und den wollte ich mir erfüllen. Kein Wort von Einsamkeit, Wind, Wellen oder gar Angst. Delfine habe sie unterwegs gesehen und eine Menge Wasser. Vielmehr verrät sie nicht von ihrem umstrittenen Abenteuer, das im Vorfeld so viel Wirbel ausgelöst hatte. Den Eltern wurde deswegen zeitweise sogar das Sorgerecht entzogen. Doch Laura setzt den tollkühnen Plan durch. Hisst die Piratenflagge und sticht im August 2010 in Gibraltar in See. Mit 14, Mutterseelen allein, aber mit reichlich Selbstbewusstsein. Die Route führt über den Atlantik, durch die Karibik und den Panamakanal weiter nach Australien. Dort wirft sie ihre Schulbücher über Bord und ändert die ursprüngliche Route. Statt durch den Golf von Aden, wo es vor Piraten wimmelt, segelt sie am Kap der Guten Hoffnung vorbei, wieder durch den Atlantik bis nach St. Martin. Gefährlich war das nicht, meint Laura, ist sie doch von Hafen zu Hafen gesegelt und war nie länger als fünf Wochen am Stück auf hoher See. Als jüngste Weltumseglerin löst Laura nun die Australierin Jessica Watson ab. Doch ins Guinness-Buch kommt sie trotzdem nicht. Denn Rekorde von Minderjährigen werden dort nicht mehr anerkannt. Macht nichts, denn Laura wollte ja ohnehin nur segeln. Nach anderthalb Jahren hat Laura nun ihr Ziel erreicht. Offiziell anerkannt wird ihr Rekord als jüngste Solo-Weltumseglerin allerdings nicht. Das Guinness-Buch der Rekorde und der Weltsegelrat wollen keinen Anreiz für andere minderjährige Nachahmer schaffen. Ina Dont über die Rückkehr eines ungewöhnlichen Teenagers. Laura Decker hat sich ihren Lebenstraum bereits als 16-Jährige erfüllt und lässt sich dafür feiern. Auf den letzten Metern vor der Karibikinsel St. Martin wird sie von Freunden, Fans und der Weltpresse begleitet. Erleichtert erwartet sie die Familie. Mutter Barbara war gegen die Reise, doch das scheint jetzt vergessen. Vater Rick flüstert ihr zu gut gemacht, Mädchen, ich bin stolz auf dich. Ich bin froh und erleichtert. Auf der anderen Seite ist es ein komisches Gefühl. Zunächst hatten die niederländischen Behörden der damals 13-Jährigen den Wind aus den Segeln genommen, sie unter Obhut der Jugendfürsorge gestellt. Als 14-Jährige sticht sie in See unter der strengen gerichtlichen Auflage, regelmäßig ihre Hausaufgaben zu machen. Auf ihrer Internetseite erzählt sie, dass sie meist Nudeln und Eierkuchen isst und wenig Zeit hat für die Schule. Als die niederländischen Medien berichten, sie habe die Schule ganz geschmissen, segelt Laura aus Protest unter neuseeländischer Flagge weiter. Offiziell begann die Weltumsegelung im Januar 2011. Sie hat den Pazifik durchquert in Australien ihren 16. Geburtstag gefeiert und dann aus Angst vor Piraten die Strecke um Südafrika herum gewählt. Nach 27.000 Meilen auf See will sie jetzt die Schule beenden. Es ging mir nie darum, einen Rekord zu brechen. Es ist lustig, dass ich die Jüngste bin, die um die Welt gesegelt ist. Aber es ging mir um die Reise, die ich für mich ganz allein gemacht habe. 
Im Februar will Laura Decker in die Niederlande reisen, wo sie auf einer Bootsmesse über ihre Abenteuer berichtet. Leben will sie künftig in Neuseeland. Seit Tagen hatten sie sich auf ihren Einsatz vorbereitet. Seit dem Nachmittag steht fest, die niederländische Spezialfirma kann mit dem Abpumpen des Treibstoffes aus der havarierten Costa Concordia beginnen. Gleichzeitig kann die Suche nach dem Vermissten fortgeführt werden. Diese Arbeiten sind absolut parallel möglich. Das heißt, wir haben bereits die Anweisungen gegeben, mit dem Abpumpen sofort zu beginnen. Noch müssen weitere Vorbereitungen für den Einsatz getroffen werden. Frühestens morgen dann soll ein Loch in den Rumpf des Schiffes gebohrt werden, um die rund 2400 Tonnen Treibstoff nach und nach aus den 17 Tanks zu pumpen. Neueste Messdaten zeigen, dass das Kreuzfahrtschiff stabil im Wasser liegt und nicht, wie zunächst befürchtet, droht in die Tiefe zu rutschen. Mit gezielten Explosionen verschaffen sich die Einsatzkräfte am Morgen weitere Zugänge ins Innere des Schiffes. Sie vermuten, dass zwischen dem vierten und fünften Deck weitere Vermisste zu finden sind. Am Mittag finden die Taucher zwei Leichen. Beides Frauen, deren Identität bisher unklar ist. Ob sie zu den Vermissten der Passagierliste oder zu den vermuteten blinden Passagieren zählen, ist derzeit ebenfalls unklar. Und noch etwas fanden die Taucher. Die Seekarte. Sie könnte einen entscheidenden Hinweis liefern. Denn bisher behauptet der Kapitän, dass der Felsen, an den er sein Schiff lenkte, nicht in der Karte eingezeichnet war. Auch zehn Tage nach dem Unglück bleibt völlig unklar, was genau zu der Katastrophe geführt hat und wie viele Passagiere sich noch immer im Inneren der Costa Concordia befinden. Schon eigenartig, was die Weltpolitik da gerade mal wieder zustande bringt. Die EU beschließt Sanktionen gegen Iran und die EU könnte gewissermaßen selbst darunter zu leiden haben. Denn Öl wird schließlich gebraucht, aber vom Iran will man es nicht mehr nehmen. Ein Embargo, das ab Juli greifen soll. In Europa ist man sich sicher, dass man die Auswirkungen mit anderen Lieferanten abfedern könne. Weniger sicher scheint zu sein, wie wirksam dieses Embargo ist. Das Ziel ist, Teheran zur Aufgabe, etwaige Pläne zum Bau von Atomwaffen zu bringen. Keine Klasche. Mit einem Ölembargo die Wirtschafts- und Finanzkraft des Iran treffen. Das ist das Ziel der EU, die den iranischen Ölfluss zumindest nach Europa zum Versiegen bringen will. Die Sanktionen sind notwendig, weil eine atomare Bewaffnung des Iran im Interesse der Sicherheit unserer Welt verhindert werden muss. Und diese Sanktionen können jederzeit abgewendet werden, wenn der Iran seinen völkerrechtlichen Verpflichtungen nachkommt. Folgende EU-Sanktionen sollen das Land zur Zusammenarbeit bewegen. Ein Ölembargo ab dem 1. Juli, ein Lieferverbot von Schlüsseltechnologien und Einfrieren aller Konten der iranischen Zentralbank. Iran bezieht 70 Prozent seiner Einkünfte aus dem Ölexport. Europa deckt jedoch nur rund 6 Prozent seines Bedarfs mit iranischem Öl. Öl ist nach Bekanntwerden des Embargos kaum teurer geworden. Zu gering ist die Menge, die die EU aus dem Iran bezieht. Da sieht es andersherum schon anders aus, denn für den Iran ist Europa ein Hauptabnehmer und trifft den Iran in einer Phase, wo es wirtschaftlich eh nicht besonders gut läuft. Von daher werden die Sanktionen durchaus ihre Wirkung haben. Iran drohte mit der Schließung der Straße von Hormuz. Über diese Seestraße wird jede fünfte Tonne des weltweit vermarkteten Öls transportiert. Im Moment soll es jedoch keinerlei Behinderungen des Schiffsverkehrs geben. Amerikanische Flugzeuge überwachen die Region. Heute steuerte der amerikanische Flugzeugträger Abraham Lincoln durch die Meeresenge von Hormuz in Sichtweite der iranischen Küste. Es war nicht die einzige Drohgeste gegen das Ayatollah-Regime. Die zweite ist noch massiver. Die EU verhängte heute ein Ölembargo gegen Iran. Ab Juli sollen alle Importe von dort verboten sein. Das ist kein Kinderkram. Die EU ist der zweitgrößte Abnehmer von iranischem Öl. So will man Verhandlungen über Irans Atomprogramm erzwingen. Doch das Embargo könnte in Iran gerade den Hardlinern in die Hände spielen. Mehr dazu von Bernadette Kallenberg. Die Nervosität steigt auf allen Seiten. Iran hat gerade seine Soldaten ins Manöver geschickt, um zu demonstrieren, ja, wir werden die Sperrung der Straße von Hormuz notfalls auch mit Gewalt verteidigen. Jetzt legt der Westen nach im riskanten Poker. Der US-Flugzeugträger Abraham Lincoln passiert heute demonstrativ die Hoheitsgewässer Irans und die EU stoppt die Ölimporte. 
Ich will betonen, sagt die EU-Außenbeauftragte Ashton, dass wir damit zweigleisig fahren. Die Sanktionen haben eigentlich den Zweck, Iran an den Verhandlungstisch zurückzubringen. Mit dem Boykott wird eine traditionsreiche Verbindung gekappt. Die Ursprünge der britischen BP etwa gehen auf eine Konzession zur Ölsuche in Persien im Jahr 1901 zurück. Die EU importiert heute nur rund 20 Prozent des iranischen Öls, das durch die Straße von Hormuz zwischen Iran und Oman in den Westen verschifft wird. Schon 2007 hatten die Amerikaner im Streit um das Atomprogramm eine Armada von Kriegsschiffen hier auffahren lassen. Sie waren es, die die Europäer nun zu dem drastischen Schritt gedrängt haben. Die Option einer Atombombe in den Händen des Iran, das wäre nicht nur gefährlich für die gesamte Region, sondern auch für die Sicherheitsarchitektur der Welt. Funktionieren kann ein Embargo allerdings nur, wenn alle mitmachen. Doch andere Großkunden wie China, Japan, Indien importieren weiter. Auch der Kreml sagte heute deutlich Njet zu dem Embargo. Uneins über den Boykott waren auch die EU-Staaten. Die Griechen wollen einen Aufschub. Sie haben Probleme, anderweitig an Öl zu kommen auf dem Weltmarkt, wegen ihrer Finanznöte. Iran hat daraus nie ein Problem gemacht und deshalb bezieht Griechenland jetzt 30 Prozent seines Öls aus dem Iran. Wir müssen an der Stelle damit rechnen, dass wir von Griechenland um Hilfe gefragt werden. Die EU wird sich auf Ausgleichszahlungen gefasst machen müssen. Das nimmt sie in Kauf. Ebenso wie den Umstand, dass das iranische Volk empfindlich getroffen wird. Die harte Linie schwächt nicht nur die Wirtschaft, sondern auch die oppositionellen, gemäßigten Kräfte im Land. Doch die EU will Flanke zeigen, selbst wenn sich das Embargo demnächst an der heimischen Tankstelle unangenehm bemerkbar macht. Good morning. Today is Monday, January 23rd, and this is the International Space Station update from Mission Control Center at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. The Orbit 2 team is on duty today. It's being led by Flight Director Dina Cantella, along with veteran astronaut Shannon Lucen, who is serving as the uh, Capcom today. On board the Expedition 30 crew includes and here's a photograph of the crew from left to right. We have Anton uh, Shekaplerov, and in the center front is Commander Dan Burbank. Behind him, Anaton, um, Anatoly uh, Ivanishin, Oleg Kononenko, Andre Kopers, and Don Pettit. That is the Expedition 30 crew. It will be a busy week for the crew. It includes the undocking of the Progress 45 today at 4.10 p.m. Central Time. In the open hatchway of the Progress is an 88-pound mini-satellite called the Chibis-M, and it will be deployed tomorrow to spend several years collecting data on plasma wave activity in the ionosphere. Chibis-M will be deployed at 5.19 p.m. Central Time, at a point in which the Progress will be 62 miles above and 7,300 miles behind the International Space Station. After the satellite is deployed, Russian flight controllers will send commands to deorbit the Progress 45 so that it can burn up in the atmosphere over the Pacific. On Wednesday, Progress 46 will launch and dock to the station on Friday evening. So today at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, the new Progress 46 cargo craft is in the final prepara preparations for launch. Uh, it will launch on Wednesday, U.S. time, early Thursday morning on Baikonur time. Progress 46 is loaded with 2,050 pounds of propellant, 110 pounds of oxygen and air, and 926 pounds of water, and 2,778 pounds of maintenance and experiment equipment for a total of 2.9 tons of cargo. The new Progress is scheduled again for liftoff on Wednesday at 5.06 p.m. Central Time. It will automatically dock to the piers docking compartment on Friday at 6.08 p.m. Central Time. Today, the Expedition 30 crew is conducting the fifth SPHERES uh, Zero-G Robotics Competition. Thousands of students will be involved in that activity today, uh, many of those via webcast. Plus, several hundred are in attendance at MIT and the Erasmus Center in the Netherlands. SPHERES stands for Synchronized Position Hold, Engage, Reorient Experimental Satellites. And these uh, satellites are three uh, eight-inch diameter miniaturized satellites, and they can operate in a number of environments, including the International Space Station. 
The experiment uh, offers an opportunity for high school students to design research for the International Space Station. And as part of the competition, students write uh, algorithms for the SPHERE satellites to accomplish tasks that are relevant to uh, future space missions. Each year, the game changes. And this year, uh, the MIT group, uh, in an effort to encourage cooperation with the players, uh, between the players, created a fictitious scenario where two satellites need to uh, mine for a new source of energy at two asteroids. Of course, uh, all of this is a virtual experiment. Don Pettit and Andre Coopers, um, Coipers will be assisting with that experiment today, and they'll be talking with astronaut Greg Shematov, who is at MIT, helping to facilitate the event. Also today on board the space station, Dan Burbank will be performing the in-flight maintenance, removing and replacing of the atmosphere revitalization major constituent analyzer. And in the afternoon, he will be sampling fluid from the Japanese Kobo internal thermal control system. That sample built will be returned to the ground. During this morning's mission management team meeting, managers were told that the space station is in good shape in regards to consumables with enough food, water, and propellant to operate, and that the Progress 46 would carry a new handle to the station's ARED, which is one of the pieces of equipment, uh, exercise equipment on board the station. The crew is also uh, today, uh, the managers were informed that the crew also today was taking, were taking pictures of the end defector or the grappling mechanism on the station's robotic arm uh, for examination. And flight controllers are also monitoring a piece of uh, satellite debris from the uh, Fengyong Chinese satellite. Um, they began um, monitoring that earlier and are beginning preparations in case the uh, debris avoidance maneuver is required. And if it is required, that will occur on Tuesday morning. This is your update for Monday, January 23rd from Mission Control Houston. Taucher haben im Wrack des havarierten Kreuzfahrtschiffes Costa Concordia eine weitere Leiche gefunden. Die ältere Frau habe eine Rettungsweste getragen, so die Einsatzleitung. Damit erhöht sich die Zahl der Toten auf mindestens 16. 22 weitere Menschen werden immer noch vermisst. Unterdessen haben die Vorarbeiten für das Abpumpen der 2300 Tonnen Treibstoff an Bord begonnen. Burkhard Wennemar und Udo Gümpel berichten. Am frühen Vormittag ziehen Schlepper ein Kranboot der niederländischen Bergungsfirma Smith an die linke Seite der gekenterten Costa Concordia. Mit Hilfe des Krans sollen die Gegengewichte zu dem abzupumpenden Schweröl an Bord gehievt werden, damit das Schiff in der Balance bleibt. Hier auf der Backbordseite der Costa Concordia, auf der linken Schiffseite, werden die großen Löcher in die Schweröltanks getrieben, die hier unter den Passagierkabinen liegen. Es werden insgesamt 270 Tonnen hier in dem ersten Abpumpversuch geholt. Falls dabei keine Komplikationen auftreten, wird voraussichtlich ab Samstag damit begonnen, den Großteil des Öls aus den 23 Tanks abzupumpen. Das wird mindestens drei Wochen dauern. Das Hauptproblem ist die Dickflüssigkeit des Öls. Deshalb werden wir das Öl zunächst erhitzen müssen, bevor wir es herauspumpen können. Ob das Schiff anschließend aufgerichtet und weggeschleppt oder noch an Ort und Stelle zerlegt wird, ist offenbar noch nicht endgültig entschieden. Unterdessen haben Taucher dokumentiert, welche Gewalten gewirkt haben müssen, als die 50.000 Tonnen schwere Costa Concordia den Felsen Les Kohle gerammt hat. Der Fels hat riesige Teile aus dem Luxuslane herausgerissen und den Stahl verbogen wie dünnes Blech. Das Schiff wiederum hat einen großen Brocken aus dem Fels gebrochen. Er steckt noch immer wie ein Stachel im Rumpf des gekenterten Kreuzfahrtriesen. Neueste Messungen haben gezeigt, die havarierte Costa Concordia liegt fest und droht derzeit nicht weiter abzurutschen. Auch das Meer ist ruhig. Taucher haben inzwischen ein weiteres Opfer geborgen. Damit erhöht sich die Zahl der Toten auf 16. Zeitgleich bereiten sich nun Experten darauf vor, die gewaltigen Mengen Treibstoff aus dem Schiff zu pumpen. Um 7.40 Uhr heute Morgen war es soweit. Die Arbeitsplattform der holländischen Spezialfirma machte sich auf den Weg zur Costa Concordia. 2400 Tonnen Schwer- und Dieselöl lagern in den 17 Tanks des Wracks. Der Treibstoff ist so zähflüssig wie Teer, deshalb muss er zuerst auf 60 Grad erwärmt werden, bevor man ihn abpumpen kann. Gleichzeitig muss Wasser nachfließen, um die Stabilität des Schiffes zu gewährleisten. Ein komplizierter und langwieriger Vorgang. Zunächst werden wir deshalb sechs Tanks leeren, doch die beinhalten bereits die Hälfte des gesamten Schweröls. Bis gestern hieß es noch, bevor diese Arbeiten beginnen können, müsste die Rettung der Vermissten abgeschlossen sein. Doch das Schiff liegt so stabil, dass beides gleichzeitig möglich ist. 
Auf diesen Moment haben vor allen Dingen auch die Inselbewohner sehnsüchtig gewartet. Denn würde das giftige Öl aus dem Schiff auslaufen, wäre die Umwelt hier für Jahre zerstört und damit auch die Lebensgrundlage der Menschen. Immer wieder gab es auch heute gezielte Sprengungen, um leichter suchen zu können. Das Hauptaugenmerk galt diesmal Deck 3. Diese Bilder verdeutlichen, wie schwer die Orientierung für die Taucher ist. In der Dunkelheit zwischen umgestürzten Mobiliar und versperrten Wegen. Dennoch wurden sie fündig. Sie konnten eine weitere Tote bergen. Unser Amerika-Korrespondent Carsten Mirke mit den Bildern. Erst als es wieder hell wurde in Birmingham, Alabama, war klar, wie schwer die Tornados in der Nacht gewütet hatten. Ganze Nachbarschaften unbewohnbar. Zwei Menschen starben und Tausende sind unter Schock. Alia Ower blickt fassungslos auf das Bett ihres zweijährigen Sohnes Mitchell. Ich kann gar nicht glauben, dass er nur Minuten vorher da noch drin lag. Zusammen mit ihrem Mann suchten sie Schutz in dieser Kunststoffwanne. Wir kauerten uns zusammen und beteten, dass wir das überleben. Das nächtliche Sturmsystem mit schweren Gewittern erstreckte sich vom Golf von Mexiko bis hoch zur kanadischen Grenze, traf aber besonders hart das Zentrum vom Alabama rund um Birmingham. 50.000 Haushalte sind ohne Strom und die Menschen in den Südstaaten der USA werden noch lange brauchen, um das alles wieder aufzuräumen. Sturm seit neun Jahren hat heute Mittag unsere Erde erreicht. Die gewaltige Gaswolke aus elektrisch geladenen Teilchen hatte sich gestern von der Sonne gelöst und raste seitdem auch auf die Erde zu. Dadurch könnten heute Abend bei klarer Sicht sogar in unseren Breiten Polarlichter zu sehen sein. Für Menschen ist so ein Sonnensturm ungefährlich, da uns das natürliche Magnetfeld der Erde schützt. Weil die Teilchen aber die Leistung von Satelliten beeinflussen, könnten der Flugverkehr und Handynetze gestört werden. Schauen wir mal. Ein Sonnensturm hat das Magnetfeld der Erde getroffen in einer Dimension, wie es die Wissenschaft seit Jahren nicht beobachtet hat. Jasmin Parvis hat die Bilder und die Erklärung. 150 Millionen Kilometer trennen uns von der Sonne. Dass es dort ständig brodelt, bekommen wir meist nicht mit. Aber seit Anfang der Woche gibt es die heftigsten Explosionen seit fast neun Jahren. Hier die aktuellsten Bilder von der Oberfläche des Planeten. 100 Millionen Tonnen Partikel wurden ins All geschleudert. Und diese sogenannten Sonnenstürme haben auch ihre Auswirkungen auf die Erde. Unserer hochtechnisierten Welt drohen Blackouts. Effekte von solchen Sonnenstürmen können auch im technischen Bereich sein, dass sie äh, Störungen der, des Funkverkehrs verursachen. Sie können auch Satelliten insoweit schädigen, dass die Sonnenzellen geschwächt werden, also ein Strahlungsschaden entsteht, der sich nicht mehr reparieren lässt. Die ausgestoßenen Partikel rasen mit rund 1000 Kilometern pro Sekunde durch das All, durchdringen das Magnetfeld der Erde und setzen gewaltige Energien frei. Im Jahr 2003 wurden aus Sicherheitsgründen Satelliten abgeschaltet, es gab weltweit Stromausfälle und Probleme bei der Navigation und Überwachung im Flugverkehr. Auch heute Abend wurden bereits einige Flüge auf nördlichen Routen umgeleitet. Die radioaktive Strahlung ist besonders stark in Polnähe. Manche Fluggesellschaften weichen deswegen auf etwas südlichere Routen aus, wenn sie zum Beispiel von Frankfurt nach Tokio fliegen. Die schöne Seite der Sonnenstürme? Polarlichter. Diese hier wurden vorletzte Nacht in Norwegen gefilmt. Und mit ein wenig Glück und klarer Sicht wird man das Himmelsphänomen heute Nacht wohl auch über Norddeutschland zu sehen bekommen. Das Phänomen Sonnensturm noch einmal anschaulich in Wort und Bild erklärt, jederzeit unter www.heute.de. Ein gewaltiger Sonnensturm sorgt in diesen Tagen für ein Spektakel am Abendhimmel. Besonders gut konnte man die sogenannten Polarlichter in einigen Ländern Nordeuropas beobachten. Sie entstehen, wenn elektrisch aufgeladene Teilchen der Sonne in die Erdatmosphäre eindringen. Eine Gefahr für Menschen besteht nicht. Allerdings können Mobilfunknetze und Fernsehübertragungen gestört werden. Good morning and welcome to today's International Space Station Update Hour here from the Flight Control Room in Houston, Texas. Getting a look now inside is ground personnel monitor systems on board the orbiting laboratory. Currently on console is the Orbit 2 team. And they are being led today by Flight Director Ron Spencer there on the right side of your screen. And joining him at the Capcom console is veteran astronaut Shannon Lucid. She is serving as the communication link between controllers here on the ground and astronauts up in space. 
and those astronauts currently on board the station are the crew of Expedition 30. Led by NASA astronaut and Commander Dan Burbank, there in the front left of your screen. Behind him are Russian cosmonauts Anton Shkoflarov and Anatoly Ivanishin. And then rounding out the crew on the right side are European Space Agency astronaut Andrei Kuipers, Russian cosmonaut Olog Kononenko, and NASA astronaut Don Pettit. Crew very busy today with a variety of experiment work and engaged in some maintenance activities with the systems on board the station. Commander Burbank is spending the vast majority of his day today doing some fluid sampling collection on the internal thermal control systems in a few of the U.S. segments, including the Columbus Laboratory as well as the Japanese exposed module. Russian cosmonaut Anton Shkaplerov is hard at work on a progress tour route drill, which is in anticipation of the upcoming 46 progress docking. Toru is the manual control system that serves as a backup to the Progress's automated KERS system when it is in its final docking stages. He will also be participating in a public affairs event with Russian stations doing a TV greeting. And joining him will be Anatoly Venetian and Oleg Kononenko, the three Russian cosmonauts currently on board. And then of those three, Anatoly Ivanishin started his day off doing some work with the Matryoshka, which is a Russian experiment that, work, that works to look at radiation effects on the human body while in the microgravity environment of the International Space Station. He also did some coolant maintenance work today, as well as doing some pretty extensive audits of the inventory in both the Zvezda and Zarya modules as a progress vehicle recently departed just yesterday and the upcoming one requires some pretty serious looking over. Olag Kononenko started his day off with a physical experiment called Sprut 2. That is a Russian experiment that takes body ma mass measurements and then has Kononenko do a quick run and then take further measurements afterwards. He's joining Shkoplarov in that Toru drill as well as that public affairs event. European astronaut Andrei Kuipers spent much of his day doing some setup and testing of the urine monitoring system, which works within the waste and hygiene compartment. And then aside from that, he was doing some battery charging of the EMUs in advance of an upcoming spacewalk February 16th that will be done by some of the Russian crewmates. He was charging up some batteries for their pistol grip tools. Final member of Expedition 30, Don Pettit, did some work on the integrated cardiovascular monitoring system, setting that up, and that's looking at the heart muscle and any atrophy that occurs. You will also be doing a safety video tour of the station, which is required once every increment, so once every expedition, uh, and that is for the benefit of controllers here on the ground. And then as mentioned yesterday, a progress vehicle, 45P, undocked at about 4.10 p.m. Central Time, taking with it, uh, much of the trash on board the station that will eventually deorbit and burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. This was in anticipation of the 46th progress launch, which is scheduled to take place tomorrow, Wednesday, January 25th, at 5.06 p.m. Central Time, with the eventual docking on Friday. That progress vehicle just recently rolled out to its launch pad, as you can see here. The President of the United States. Es hat alles seine feierliche Form, wenn der Präsident sich an die Nation wendet. Und doch war es letzte Nacht auch Obamas Aufbruch in den Wahlkampf. Wandel versprach er vor vier Jahren, jetzt setzt er ein neues Ziel. Soziale Gerechtigkeit für alle in einem Amerika, in dem die Schere zwischen Arm und Reich immer weiter klafft. Wir können uns für ein Land entscheiden, in dem es einer schrumpfenden Zahl von Menschen immer besser geht, während eine wachsende Gruppe kaum über die Runden kommt, oder wir schaffen eine Wirtschaft, in der jeder eine Chance hat und in der für alle die gleichen Regeln gelten. 
Obama will, dass Millionäre mehr Steuern zahlen und Firmen belohnt werden, die Jobs nach Amerika holen. Obama greift an. Der von Republikanern dominierte Kongress torpediere seine Steuerpläne, die Amerika aus der Krise führten. Schicken Sie mir diese Gesetze und ich unterschreibe sie sofort. Da zucken sie nicht mal mit den Augenbrauen und schießen zurück aus dem fernen Indianer. Gouverneur Daniels nennt Obamas Steuerplan Klassenkampf. Nichts ist schlimmer als der Versuch Obamas, uns zu spalten, sich beeinigen, einzuschmeicheln und andere zu geißeln. Obama bricht heute auf, um in der Tiefe des Landes zu überprüfen, ob seine Botschaft die verunsicherten Bürger überzeugen kann. Auch wenn die Republikaner noch ihren Kandidaten suchen, kann man schon jetzt sagen, der Präsidentschaftswahlkampf in den USA ist eröffnet. Präsident Barack Obama nutzte vergangene Nacht seine Rede an die Nation vor dem Kongress vor allem dafür, sich als Anwalt der kleinen Leute zu präsentieren. Mit dieser Strategie will er, wenn im November gewählt wird, verloren gegangenes Vertrauen bei den Amerikanern zurückgewinnen. Aus Washington, Peter Kleim. Was für ein Schauspiel. Mr. Speaker! The President of the United States. Applaus für einen Präsidenten, den die meisten in diesem tief verfeindeten Kongress scheitern sehen wollen. Solange ich Präsident bin, werde ich mit allen hier zusammenarbeiten, schaltet Obama gleich zu Beginn auf Konfrontationskurs. Aber ich werde alles verhindern, was uns zu der Politik zurückbringt, die uns in die Krise geführt hatte. Die Rede vor rund 50 Millionen Zuschauern, sie war Obamas Wahlkampfauftakt. Und bei dem gab sich Obama kämpferisch, denn auch wenn die Konjunktur langsam wieder anzieht, viele Amerikaner glauben ihm nicht, dass er das Land nach vorn bringt. Nur rund jeder Zweite ist mit Obamas Amtsführung zufrieden, so erklärt in einer Kleinstadt in Virginia ein Rentner. Für mich ist der Präsident so eine Art Sozialist, der Dinge wie in Europa hier einführen will und die Eurokrise zeige ja, wo das hinführt. Ein paar Häuser weiter hören wir nachdenklichere Töne. Die Inhaberin eines Teeladens sagt, eigentlich würde sie von Obamas Politik profitieren. As a small business owner, als Inhaberin eines kleinen Geschäftes konnte ich mir bislang keine Krankenversicherung leisten, aber leider werde Obamas Idee noch immer blockiert. Ausgerechnet am Tag, an dem Multimillionär Romney Obamas möglicher Herausforderer erklärt, dass er weniger als 14 Prozent Steuern zahlt, fordert Obama Gerechtigkeit. Entweder Wohlstand für nur wenige oder ein Land, in dem jeder eine faire Chance hat, jeder seinen fairen Beitrag leistet und jeder sich an die gleichen Regeln hält. Es wird ein spannender Wahlkampf. Good morning and welcome to today's International Space Station Update Hour. Getting a look now here inside the flight control room in Houston, Texas, while the Orbit 2 team is on console monitoring systems on board the orbiting laboratory. That team today is being led by Flight Director Ron Spencer there in the center of your screen. And joining him just to the top is Capcom. Richard Arnold serving as the communication link between controllers here on the ground and the astronauts in space. And those crew members up there right now are the Expedition 30 crew. And they are being led by NASA astronaut Dan Burbank there in the front center of your screen on the left. And then behind him, Russian cosmonauts Anton Shkaplerov and Anatoly Ivanishin. On the right side of the screen, you have the remaining three crew members, European Space Agency astronaut Andrei Kuipers, Russian cosmonaut Oleg Kononenko, and NASA astronaut Don Pettit. Crew awoke today at about midnight central time and began their day with a daily, daily planning conference before moving into some ver fairly rigorous experiment and maintenance activities. Commander Burbank is finishing up some internal thermal control sam system sampling, taking some samples from the tranquility and harmony modules today, as well as doing a Microscope checkout on the JAXA clean bench in the Kibo Japanese module. Later on in the day, he'll be doing some on orbit training with the Space Station's remote manipulator system or the robotic arm, along with Andre Kuipers and Don Pettit. You can see that robotic arm there, just in the center of your screen. Russian cosmonaut Anton Shkaplerov is continuing with some cargo stowage audits. 
as there has been a number of resupply actions going on here with a recent progress departure just a few days ago and the progress launch scheduled for later today. He will also be participating in the BAR experiment, which is a Russian look at selection and testing of different detection methods and then means for searching for depressurization of any of the International Space Station modules. And he'll be joined in that by fellow Russian cosmonaut Anatoly Ivanishin. Ivanishin, along with that BAR experiment, will be working on Pneumocard, which is a, another Russian study that looks at the adaptation of the astronaut's cardiovascular system, one of the many bodily systems that is affected during that, by that microgravity environment during these long-duration space flights. The final Russian cosmonaut, Alog Kononenko, is also assisting Shkoplarov in some of that equipment audit, looking at all the cargo remaining on board before doing some maintenance on the Russian segment coolant systems as well as the electron system which generates oxygen for the astronauts on board. European Space Agency astronaut Andre Kuipers did some work in the nano racks today doing a microscope checkout of his own before doing some software updates and also participating in a public affairs event with European industry leaders and media on the ground. Rounding out the crew, astronaut Don Pettit participated in the LEGOs experiment, which uses the famous LEGO building blocks that you can find here on Earth. He built a LEGO model of the Solar Dynamics Observatory, as well as a radar satellite as part of an educational event on board the station. He'll also do some maintenance on the waste and hygiene compartment and also starting up his integrated cardiovascular monitoring system, which is an American experiment similar to that Russian pneumocard studying the cardiovascular system. The other major event on the docket for today will be that Progress 46 launch, which will take place later today at 5.06 p.m. Central Time. Good day from the International Space Station Flight Control Room at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. You're looking live, courtesy of the Russian Federal Space Agency, Roscosmos, at a view of the launch pad of the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, a half a world away in the Central Asian Desert. You're looking at the ISS Progress 46 cargo ship, the latest in the series of Russian resupply vehicles, the unmanned cargo ship that is poised for launch just 21 minutes from now on a trajectory that will take it on a two-day flight to dock to the pier's docking compartment on the Russian segment of the International Space Station on Friday evening. The Progress 46 vehicle is loaded with almost three tons of food, fuel, and supplies for the six crew members comprising the Expedition 30 crew aboard the International Space Station. On Tuesday morning, uh, just after sunrise, the Progress was hauled uh, as uh, are all Soyuz booster rockets horizontally on a rail car from its assembly processing hangar at the Baikonur Cosmodrome to the launch pad uh, at Baikonur, the same launch pad uh, that Yuri Gagarin launched from as the first human in space back on April 12, 1961. Uh, it was hydraulically lifted into its vertical position on the launch pad and the launch uh, table or the launch platform was rotated to the proper azimuth uh, for the final stages of preparations as launch pad workers working in single digit uh, temperatures Fahrenheit at the Baikonur Cosmodrome work to hook up uh, power and data and uh, relay circuits uh, to the spacecraft itself in preparation for its launch uh, this evening to the Baikonur Cos from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan to the International Space Station. The uh, progress uh, of the uh, resupply ship's path to the International Space Station uh, will be controlled from the Russian Mission Control Center in Korolyov, outside of Moscow. You're looking live at a view from a balcony camera overlooking the International Space Station's flight control room at uh, Korolyov. Uh, the flight controllers there will assume control of the Progress's two-day journey once uh, the third stage uh, 
Booster stage of the Soyuz booster rocket has shut down, placing the Progress spacecraft into its preliminary orbit with its solar arrays and navigational antennas deployed. Uh, this flight control team works uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as does the flight control team here in Houston at the Johnson Space Center, uh, which currently is under the control of the Orbit 3 team of flight controllers, the evening shift, if you will, uh, that is led uh, this evening by flight director Ed Van Seis. He is uh, talking directly to his Russian flight director counterpart at the Russian Mission Control Center in Karlyov, outside of Moscow. On board the International Space Station, as it orbits 240 statute miles above the Earth, the Expedition 30 crew is asleep at this hour. The six crew members from left to right in this crew portrait, uh, Russian uh, Soyuz Commander Anton Shkoplerov, uh, the Expedition 30 Commander Dan Burbank of NASA, and uh, Anatoly Ivanishin, uh, who launched uh, back on November 14th to the space station along with Burbank and Shkoplerov, and the other half of the uh, Expedition 30 crew, European Space Agency uh, astronaut Andrei Kuipers, Alek Kononenko, who was the Soyuz Commander uh, for the most recent uh, Soyuz launch back on December 21st from Baikonur that carried Kononenko, and on the far right, NASA flight engineer Don Pettit to the International Space Station. Those six crew members uh, put in a busy day today on board the International Space Station, a day that was uh, filled with uh, onboard training of uh, the robotics uh, uh, that is a periodic uh, training course for them uh, on the operation of the Canadarm2. They also uh, performed a number of uh, scientific experiments and other uh, in-flight maintenance uh, that is the periodic uh, tour de force for the expedition crews on board the International Space Station. Uh, the station itself is currently orbiting uh, in darkness over the uh, South Atlantic, 240 miles above the Earth, moving from southwest to northeast in an orbit inclined 51.6 degrees to either side of the equator. At the time of launch, just 17 minutes from now, uh, the International Space Station will be flying directly over the country of Chad in the Central African continent. The uh, launch uh, is timed, uh, as you see uh, another live view of the Progress 46 vehicle on the launch pad at Baikonur, where the temperature at this hour is 5 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the pre-dawn hours of Thursday at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Uh, this launch is timed uh, to the moment at which uh, the Baikonur Cosmodrome, uh, the Earth's rotation will carry the Baikonur Cosmodrome uh, into the plane or corridor uh, of uh, the launch of the uh, progress of the International Space Station so that uh, the progress can begin its phasing toward the station with two rendezvous burns uh, that will be scheduled uh, later today, followed by another uh, major rendezvous burn uh, on Thursday that will begin the automated rendezvous process uh, for the progress on Friday uh, to uh, put itself into the final and terminal rendezvous operations uh, that will begin late uh, Friday afternoon Central Time, early Saturday morning Moscow Time. The Progress uh, will dock uh, to the uh, International Space Station's Piers docking compartment at uh, 6.08 p.m. Central Time on Friday evening, completing its two-day journey. The Piers docking compartment uh, was vacated on Monday when the previous Progress resupply ship, the 45 Progress, undocked uh, from the Piers docking compartment. This is a view, uh, a video that was taken from external cameras on the truss of the International Space Station as it showed the 45 Progress vehicle departing from Piers to open up that docking port for the new Progress vehicle that uh, will be launched uh, just 14 and a half minutes from now. The uh, 45 Progress vehicle, this departing vehicle on Monday, uh, backed away from the station to a safe distance with a series of uh, thruster uh, firings uh, to place itself in a higher orbit uh, from the International Space Station for the uh, deployment on Tuesday of a small nano satellite, a mini satellite called the Chibis M, uh, that will study plasma wave uh, science uh, over the course of the next several years. 
The uh, Chivas deployment occurred uh, just after 5 p.m. Central Time on Tuesday, followed three hours later by the uh, commanding by the flight controllers at the Russian Mission Control Center to deorbit uh, the 45 Progress vehicle that subsequently burned up in the Earth's atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean. Again, uh, the Piers docking compartment is now clear and ready to accept uh, the 46 Progress vehicle that will dock to it on uh, Friday evening at 6.08 p.m. Central Time. This new Progress vehicle is loaded with 2,050 pounds of propellant, 110 pounds of oxygen and air, 926 pounds of water, and 2,778 pounds of dry cargo, including spare parts, maintenance hardware, resupply items, life support system items, and experiment hardware for the half dozen crew members living and working on board the orbital laboratory. We are now just 13 minutes from launch. Uh, you're looking at a close-up view uh, of uh, the upper stage of the uh, Progress vehicle. Just a few minutes from now, the Soyuz Booster's first stage steering jets will be placed in the ready-to-launch configuration. Ground commanding will have been received uh, from the rocket, indicating that all of uh, the Soyuz Booster's primary and backup systems are ready for launch. The uh, Progress 46 vehicle uh, and its Soyuz booster will take uh, a typical uh, flight path uh, from the launch pad at Baikonur to its preliminary orbit. Uh, it generally takes uh, just under 10 minutes uh, for third stage separation to occur, followed by uh, the deployment of the Progress's solar arrays and its navigational antennas, at which point uh, control of the Progress's two-day trek to the International Space Station will be controlled uh, from that room that you're looking at right now, the International Space Station uh, Flight Control Room for the Russian Mission Control Center in Korolyov, outside Moscow. The downrange uh, Monitoring of uh, Soyuz booster performance and the systems is conducted uh, by the launch control team uh, comprised uh, by a combination of uh, Energia technicians and other Russian space organizations uh, that uh, will be monitoring uh, the performance of the Soyuz booster from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan itself. This Progress vehicle uh, will remain docked to the Piers docking compartment through April 24th, at which time uh, it uh, will undock from Piers. Uh, that uh, will be the docking port, port of choice for the next uh, several Progress resupply vehicles. Uh, four of these vehicles are launched annually by the Russians uh, to help uh, supply the International Space Station in tandem uh, with the European Space Agency's automated transfer vehicle. Uh, the ATV-3, the next uh, in the series of those vehicles, uh, is scheduled to be launched uh, from the uh, Ariane Spas launch site down in Kourou in French Guiana on March the 9th, followed uh, later in the year by uh, the next in the series of Japanese H-2 transfer vehicles, the HTV-3, uh, that uh, will be prepared for launch in the complement of resupply uh, ships to the International Space Station. Just a few minutes before 5 a.m. in Baikonur on Thursday morning, 
Uh, the temperature in the single digits as you see the liquid oxygen venting from the first stage of the Soyuz booster. We are now just uh, nine minutes, 20 seconds away from the scheduled launch of the Progress 46 to the International Space Station. And uh, from the Russian Mission Control Center, uh, the um, reports that we are receiving here indicate that uh, the Soyuz uh, boosters gyros are in flight readiness and uh, the flight recorders have been activated. The International Space Station program facing uh, an extremely busy traffic pattern over the course of the next few months. The uh, Expedition 30 commander Dan Burbank and his Russian crewmates Anton Shkaplerov and Anatoly Ivanishin are scheduled to undock uh, their Soyuz vehicle uh, from uh, the Poisk module of the International Space Station on March 16th uh, for their landing on the steppe of Kazakhstan. That will be followed uh, two weeks later on March 30th by the scheduled launch of the next trio of residents who will be en route to the International Space Station. Soyuz Commander Gennady Padalka, Flight Engineer Sergei Revin, and NASA Flight Engineer Joa Kaba, who are in the final stages of their training uh, for their launch uh, coming up in just a couple of months. Just six minutes away from launch at the Baikonur Cosmodrome, uh, launch countdown operations are moving into their automatic uh, countdown mode. A vehicle readiness check uh, by the launch engineers at Baikonur is underway at this moment. In uh, just three minutes at the uh, T minus two and a half minute mark, uh, a nitrogen purge of the uh, combustion chamber of the first stage will be conducted. Everything uh, proceeding on track for an on-time liftoff at uh, 5.06 p.m. Central Time, 5.06 a.m. Baikonur Time on Thursday morning.
Just four and a half minutes away from launch now, the uh, Soyuz uh, will be delivering 102 tons of thrust from its uh, four boosters, its liquid fuel boosters, and its single engine on the first stage. The first stage of this Soyuz booster that will deliver the Progress 46 resupply ship to orbit measures about 68 feet in length, 24 feet in diameter. It will burn uh, liquid fuel for the first two minutes and six seconds of its flight. A series of tracking stations uh, that stretch all the way from Baikonur to uh, Vladivostok near the Chinese border will be monitoring uh, the path of the Progress. The reports uh, being received from the Russian Mission Control Center from uh, the launch engineers at Baikonur indicate uh, that flight recorders are up and running in good shape and the purge of uh, the engines on the first stage of the Soyuz uh, will be getting underway just momentarily. Coming up on the one minute mark to launch, the ground propellant feed uh, to the Soyuz booster has now been terminated. The vehicle is going on internal power. One minute till launch. The first umbilical tower uh, should be uh, pulling back from uh, the Soyuz booster. That will initiate an auto sequence start. And there goes that umbilical. We're just a few seconds away from the issuance of the launch command. T-minus 20 seconds. The launch command has been issued. Main engine start. And liftoff of the ISS Progress 46, the 46th resupply ship to the International Space Station. Twenty seconds into the flight, 
Roll and pitch program initiated. Nominal performance so far from the first stage. The vehicle is stable according to the reports being received from the Russian Mission Control Center via the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Chamber pressure is nominal, going through maximum dynamic pressure downrange. Roll pitch and yaw on the vehicle is all by the book. 70 seconds into the flight, the flight is reported to be nominal. Coming up on the 1 minute 30 second mark into the flight. All parameters reported to be no nominal. The vehicle traveling almost 1,400 miles an hour. Coming up on the two minute mark into the flight, the four strap on boosters will be jettisoned and will be standing by for first stage separation. First stage separation is confirmed, everything is nominal. The Soyuz booster is traveling at about 3,500 miles an hour right now, some 30 statute miles in altitude. A few seconds from now, the escape tower and launch shroud will be jettisoned. Coming up on the three minute mark into the flight, the launch shroud has been jettisoned, exposing the Progress 46 vehicle to the launch dynamics. All control systems are reported to be nominal. Soyuz now traveling 5,000 miles an hour downrange. All systems reported to be functioning normally. The second uh, stage engines are reported to be functioning normally. Everything is uh, going by the book. 220 seconds into the flight, uh, as it is calculated by the launch engineers down in Baikonur, all systems are functioning normally. The vehicle is stable, running uh, on the second stage engines. Everything is going extremely well as the progress heads toward orbit. Roll, pitch, and yaw parameters are normal. Second stage engines are functioning normally. You're looking uh, at the progress disappearing from view, downrange, through long-range tracking cameras. 260 seconds into the flight, the flight is reported to be nominal. Coming up on the five minute mark into the flight. We've confirmed second stage separation, the third stage engines now burning. The Soyuz now at an altitude of 105 miles. Traveling almost 10,000 miles an hour downrange. The vehicle stabilization is reported to be nominal. 
almost six minutes into the flight. The single engine of the Soyuz booster's third stage providing uh, this final boost uphill for the Progress 46. Control system parameters reported to be nominal. You're looking at the International Space Station Flight Control Room at the Russian Mission Control Center in Korolyov, outside Moscow, monitoring uh, the performance uh, being reported by the launch engineering team uh, down at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Launch time was 5.06 and 40 seconds p.m. Central Time, 5.06 a.m. Baikonur Time on Thursday morning. Everything uh, continuing uh, to go by the book. Third stage engine is performing normally almost eight minutes into the flight. The flight is nominal. We're in the home stretch of the Progress 46 ascent to orbit. About 35 seconds of powered flight uh, remaining on the third stage. The third stage engine continues uh, to burn normally. Coming up on the nine minute mark into the flight, everything continues to function normally. The vehicle is still reported to be stable. 500 seconds into the flight, everything is nominal with the vehicle. We're awaiting a third stage shutdown. The control systems uh, are nominal. Third stage engine continues to function normally in its final seconds. And we have third stage shutdown and spacecraft separation. Standing by for solar array and navigational antenna deployment. And we have confirmation now of solar array deploy, navigational antenna deploy, the International Space Station's Progress 46 cargo craft now in orbit, in its preliminary orbit, en route to the International Space Station after a flawless launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The automated uh, rendezvous program loaded into the Progress's computers uh, will uh, be commanded uh, for a pair of rendezvous burns later this evening. There will be a third rendezvous burn on Thursday afternoon. And then uh, at mid-afternoon central time on Friday, the automated uh, terminal rendezvous sequence will begin. That will lead uh, the progress uh, to its docking to the piers docking compartment on Friday night at 6.08 
p.m. Central Time, 7.08 p.m. Eastern Time. So everything uh, went by the book uh, with an on-time launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The launch occurring at uh, 5.06 and 40 seconds p.m. Central Time, 5.06 a.m. Baikonur Time on Thursday morning. A nominal climb to orbit for the Soyuz booster, delivering the Progress 46 cargo ship uh, to its preliminary orbit. Progress 46 en route for its docking to the Piers docking compartment on Friday night. Welcome. Today is Thursday, January 26, and this is the International Space Station update from Mission Control uh, at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Today on board the International Space Station, that Expedition 30 crew has uh, been busy this morning. They've already had their breakfast and their lunch. Don um, Pettit has uh, been working on the ISAC, which is the uh, International Space Station Agricultural Camera. That camera takes photos of vegetated areas uh, of the northern Great Plains. The camera was built by uh, students at the University of North Dakota and is actually run by those students. In addition, Pettit has um, uh, also been uh, working on a number of other things in the lab. Uh, he made sure that that uh, agricultural camera was open. Uh, Andre Coupers has been um, working uh, with the viable payload. That uh, payload is a, a study that involves the evaluation of micro, um, microbial biofilms. It actually studies uh, space materials. It looks at the metal and textile space materials, and uh, he's been working on that this morning. He's also been working on the compound-specific analyzer. That's an analyzer that uh, does some uh, studies on oxygen in the International Space Station. Corpers also um, has been spending some time working on the Cabot Laboratory. He's been working on the Clean Bench Functional Checkout. The Clean Bench is part of the JAXA, or Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency uh, experiments. It's a facility located in that laboratory, and it is located in the Cyboy, which is also known as the Living Cell Experiment Rack. That uh, Clean Bench has two compartments, a disinfection chamber and an operation chamber and air is circulated inside to keep it clean. Crew members operate the experiment materials from outside using gloves to prevent contamination of the ambient air. And uh, that uh, also has a very <coughs> extreme microscope so that they can study the articles in that uh, experiment. Corpers also has uh, been doing some swapping this morning. Uh, he's been swapping telemetry cables from the KU antenna group number two to number one. And uh, this uh, will provide uh, better television for uh, us here at the Johnson Space Center as we capture images from the International Space Station. Uh, also in other activities, uh, Commander Burbank uh, and uh, Don Pettit have been working with uh, nutrition activities throughout the day. They've been working on the Spheres port assembly, and they've also been working in the Melfi. And the International Space Station um, Progress 46 cargo craft is also on its way to the International Space Station today. It launched late yesterday at 5.06 p.m. Central Time from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. After reaching orbit and deploying its solar arrays and navigational antennas, the Progress will conduct two automated rendezvous uh, burns. This will fine-tune its path to the International Space Station. Another such burn is on tap for later this afternoon with docking to the Piers docking compartment scheduled for tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central Time. That uh, craft is loaded with nearly three tons of water, air, propellant, and equipment for the International Space Station. And other space station news, the same piece of space debris that has had uh, NASA considering safe haven for the crew and the Soyuz vehicles earlier this week is uh, still being tracked by our ballistics team. Overnight, the TOPOs, or the Trajectory Operations Officers, we're informed that another possible conjunction with that same piece of Chinese Feng Young satellite debris uh, with two possible close encounters for the station coming in the wee hours Sunday, those, uh, that is being monitored by the crew um, and by the uh, team here at the uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center. Uh, as of this morning, that is considered a medium uh, concern for the International Space Station crew. But uh, again, mission controllers are considering some possible tweaks to the station's orbit after the docking of the Progress 46 Friday night. Today at NASA is the Day of Remembrance as we honor the crews of Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia.
We will be honoring the men and women who lost their lives uh, during the space agency's ex uh, during the agency's space exploration program. We celebrate their lives and their bravery and the advancement in human space flight. Today, here at the Johnson Space Center at 2 p.m. Central Time, we will pause to remember those crews, the crews of Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia. These astronauts and their families will always be a part of NASA. Good day and welcome. Today is Friday, January 27th. This is the International Space Station update from Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. The Orbit 2 team is on duty today, led by Flight Director Jerry Jason, along with CAPCOM, our spacecraft communicator, Christy Bertels. On board the International Space Station, we have the Expedition 30 crew. Here is a photograph of the crew beginning with the front row, and that is Commander Dan Burbank, along with Oleg Kononenko. And on the back row, beginning with Anton Shekaplerov, Anatoly Ivanishin, Andre Kupers, and Don Pettit. One of the highlights of the week aboard, this week aboard the International Space Station was the SPHERES Robotic G, uh, Zero G Robotics Competition. That SPHERES stands for Synchronized Position Hold Engage Reorient Experimental Satellites. Those are um, miniature satellites about the size of bowling balls. And more than 250 high school students are gathered along with their teachers and their family at MIT in Boston and at the Erasmus Center in the Netherlands uh, to watch as the scientist and astronaut Don Pettit, along with European astronaut Andre Kuypers, monitored those satellites as they performed tasks developed by the students. This year, the competition provided an opportunity for the students to write algorithms for the satellites to accomplish tasks that are relevant to future space missions. The students actually created a, ficti a fictitious scenario where each of the two satellites mined a new source of energy on an asteroid and then returned to the mining camp to unload. Apart from the satellites, all the other elements of the experiment were virtual. It has been a busy week for the Expedition 30 crew. They saw the departure of the Progress 45 and have made ready for the arrival of that Progress 46 vehicle tonight at 6.08 p.m. Central Time. Docking coverage begins here on NASA television at 5.30 p.m. The unmanned cargo ship will be carrying about three tons of food, air, and fuel, and it will continue to fine-tune its path on its trip today to the station with a series of mid-course correction burns of its thrusters, beginning with the final phase of its rendezvous and docking uh, to the pier's docking compartment. Also here on board uh, the International Space Station here in Mission Control, flight controllers are continuing to monitor that piece of Chinese Fengyang satellite debris. That uh, satellite debris poses a minimum concern for probability of conjunction with the station over the weekend. It remains a minimum concern due to the oddity of the debris's orbit, the recent solar activity, and also the potential for any slight fluctuation in the station's orbit following the docking with the Progress vehicle. Last night, ballistics officers here in Mission Control began calculations for a possible debris avoidance maneuver on Saturday night. That uh, maneuver would steer the station clear of the debris and also had the net effect of replacing a station reboost maneuver that was already planned for next Wednesday. A final decision on that maneuver is expected later today. If it is carried out, the VESDA service module thrusters will be fired at about 5.50 p.m. Central Time on Saturday, and it will um, that will be about 55 minutes before the first of seven different opportunities for the debris to make a close approach to the station, both on Saturday night and Sunday morning. Those opportunities violate what we call the green threshold, say the green threshold of safety here at NASA. And this is just to maneuver is just to man, uh, assure that the station is well away from any space, uh, space station debris or any debris that would hit the space station. So again, if it's conducted, the Saturday night debris avoidance maneuver will replace a reboost of the station that's planned for next Wednesday. Uh, during the week on board the space station this past Tuesday and Wednesday, Commander Burbank took fluid samples from the in, uh, internal thermal control system in the Columbus module. Uh, that uh, samples, the reports have already been received by flight controllers and there has been uh, no uh, microorganisms detected. Uh, also, um, Burbank in, uh, took um, samples in two of the station's connecting nodes, that's the Harmony and Tranquility, and also in the Japanese Kobo. 
This week he also did a Q&A session, a, a question and answer session with the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and talked with students in uh, Wise County, Virginia. He was joined by uh, astronaut Don Pettit for that student activity. Pettit did a safety tour um, video for the space station ground controllers, giving them a close-up view of what goes on inside the station. He did that on Tuesday, and then on Wednesday, he did a LEGO's brick educational activity, building a model of the Solar Dynamics Observatory and a radar satellite. Uh, he did all this from a guidebook. And then on Thursday, he cleaned the filter on the International Space Station agricultural camera. That camera captures photos of vegetation in the Great Plains, and that's a study that's run by students at the University of North Dakota. European astronaut Andre Copers uh, swapped out telemetry cables on the station's KU band antenna. Uh, that, uh, he also tested that equipment, and this helps maintain a high rate of communication between the International Space Station and ground controllers. That's important not only for good TV coverage, but it also is important for the downlink of information from the space station. Uh, Coupers also, along with uh, Dan Burbank, uh, worked in the Cabo's clean bench facility. Uh, they made sure that the facility is in working order and also activated a microscope there. And Coupers spent some time on Thursday working that viable payload with uh, that payload studies uh, micro, uh, microbial uh, development on materials that are used in space. And the three astronauts, Coupers, uh, Burbank, and Pettit, did some on-orbit training with the space station's robotic arm. If you'll notice, the, the crew is uh, having a strange uh, sleep shift today. Uh, you'll see that they uh, were awakened at midnight, and then they've had a midday meal today, and, and they've also are beginning to take a siesta. So they are sleeping right now, and they'll be asleep until about 1 central time. This is to accommodate the work that they'll do uh, on the progress docking later today. So they did, uh, will not go, asleep, uh, go to sleep again until midnight uh, tonight, or excuse me, midnight on Saturday. The biggest storm on the sun in years erupted on January 22nd with a huge solar flare, an Earth-directed coronal mass ejection, or CME, and a burst of fast-moving, highly energetic protons. According to NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center, these solar energetic particles caused the strongest solar radiation storm since September 2005. We're expecting to reach uh, the uh, solar maximum uh, uh, in terms of activity sometime around next year. So we're expecting to have uh, more uh, these kinds of, of uh, uh, solar eruptions in, in the coming uh, two or three years. Closely monitored by NASA scientists, the storm caused no major disruptions to operating technological systems in space or on the ground, such as satellite communications or high voltage power transmission. The warming of the Earth's surface continues. That, according to scientists at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York, who say the average global surface temperature in 2011 was the ninth warmest since 1880. The finding continues a trend in which nine of the ten warmest years in the modern meteorological record have occurred since 2000. GISS monitors global surface temperatures on an ongoing basis and has found that the average temperature around the globe in 2011 was 0.92 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was around 1950. To say this is a problem we don't have to concern ourselves with about until a few years from now is a mistake. We need to concern ourselves about it or concern ourselves with it now so that the outcome a few years from now is something we're well positioned to deal with. Former astronaut Scott Altman addressed Mississippi's state legislators during NASA Day at the Capitol in Jackson. The event included exhibits highlighting the Stennis Space Center's role in the past, present, and future of America's space program, as well as the center's contributions to Mississippi's economy and quality of life. AGHS on blue and Coltrank on uh, red. There's nothing new about satellites in space, but flying them inside the International Space Station? 
That's what teams of high school students from the U.S. and abroad did in the Zero Robotics Spheres Challenge 2011 Finals. Televised live on NASA TV, the event featured these bowling ball sized devices called Synchronized Position Hold Engage Reorient Experimental Satellites, being flown on the station using software programs developed by the students. Operated and maintained by the Ames Research Center, the SPHERES National Laboratory Facility on board the ISS is exploring whether these mini-satellites can affordably test spacecraft navigation in a microgravity environment. The SPHERES competition is a collaboration of NASA, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. About 350 students celebrated the 19th annual Young Astronaut Day at the Glenn Research Center. A variety of activities appealed to their interest in aeronautics, space science, and engineering. The younger children enjoyed challenges like balancing marbles on a plate in a vacuum chamber, while the older members of our next generation of explorers investigated the building of robotic vehicles able to travel across a simulated planetary surface. Selected as a NASA astronaut after seven rejections, Cleveland area native Mike Foreman spoke of how persistence can help realize your dreams. If you fail at a goal the first time, the second time, maybe even the third time, I would, uh, I would hope that you guys would get back up and keep trying, you know, to achieve the goal. It might just be, you know, to make the soccer team. The crowning activity of the day? The use of some 2,000 cans of food to build a mini space shuttle later donated to a Cleveland food bank. An engaging new NASA program brings the excitement of space exploration to children while teaching them to live a healthy lifestyle. Inspired by First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative, NASA's Train Like an Astronaut program aims to increase opportunities for kids to become more physically and mentally active. The program uses activities similar to those performed by astronauts before, during, and after space flights to help 8 to 12 year olds develop good fitness and nutrition habits. It could also be for the, us older kids uh, the, because we always need the, the adults to team in and work with our children to improve their, their physical fitness as well as to help them learn about how to live a healthier lifestyle and good nutrition. The activities in Train Like an Astronaut align with national education standards and were developed in cooperation with NASA scientists and fitness professionals who work directly with our astronauts. Actress and spaceflight activist Nichelle Nichols, who portrayed Lieutenant Uhura in the original Star Trek TV series, found many friendly fans during a recent warp speed visit to NASA Dryden Flight Research Center's facilities in Southern California. Nichols related her experiences, both as a member of the Star Trek cast and as an advocate for human exploration of space, to an appreciative audience of Dryden employees. That's what our tax dollars are doing. Uh, gaining us the future, gaining us beyond our wildest dreams, what humankind can dream of, humankind can do, and, and much more. Nichols considers one of her greatest accomplishments was helping open the door for the first women and persons of minority ethnicity to become NASA astronaut candidates, including Mae Jemison and current NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden. She stressed that Americans not only have the opportunity, but the duty to ensure that NASA's space exploration program remains viable as it seeks to go where no man or woman has gone before. I was always talking to Star Trek fans about why space, why it's important. It's our space. Well, do you understand that that's not them doing that, that's ours? It belongs us, NASA belongs to me. Yeah. Say it, everybody. NASA belongs to me. Liftoff. We have liftoff with Apollo 14. 41 years ago, on January 31st, 1971, the Apollo 14 mission began with its launch from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Astronauts Alan Shepard, Stuart Rusa, and Edgar Mitchell manned NASA's third mission to land on the moon. It looks like you're about on the bottom step and on the surface. Not bad for an old man. 
Shepard and Mitchell spent nearly 33 hours in the Fra Mauro Highlands, the same area to have been explored by the aborted Apollo 13 mission. They conducted two lunar EVAs and collected more material and scientific data than Apollo 11 and 12 combined. And famously, Commander Shepard swung the first golf club in space, sending two balls across the lunar frontier. Miles and miles and miles. Apollo 14 touched down safely in the Pacific Ocean on February 9, 1971. Good evening and welcome from the International Space Station Flight Control Room as we bring you tonight's live coverage of the Progress 46 docking to the International Space Station. Panel as well. Well, we currently only about 38 minutes away from the scheduled docking time. The Progress vehicle is carrying 2.9 tons of food, fuel, and equipment to this Expedition 30 crew currently orbiting the Earth at an altitude of about of about 251 statute miles. Meanwhile, controllers on the ground, both here in Houston and their colleagues halfway around the world at the Russian flight control room in Koryov, Russia, are monitoring the progress as it moves through the final stages of this automated docking. On panel one, line three has been... Back here in mission control, the Orbit 3 team is currently on console, and they are being led today by Flight Director Ed Van Seis, there on the right side of your screen. And then joining him at the Capcom position is Rick Davis. Currently on board awaiting this delivery is the crew of Expedition 30, and they are comprised by Commander Dan Burbank there in the front left of your screen. Also in the front row is Russian cosmonaut Alag Kononenko. And then across the back, starting from the left, are Russian cosmonauts Anton Shkaflarov and Anatoly Ivanishin, and then European Space Agency astronaut Andrei Kuipers, and finally NASA astronaut Don Pettit. Uh, shall I perform uh, the activities in the frame, in the box, on MCC Go? No, we do not need to perform those steps. Copy. Then and then as I they continue continue to converse with controllers here on the ground. The astronauts on board are awaiting the arrival of this progress craft, which will bring an end to a two-day journey that started earlier this week on Wednesday, when the Progress 46 launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan the at a local time of 5.06 a.m. on Thursday, 5.06 p.m. Wednesday here in Houston. Of the Progress craft is Progress carrying with it about 2,050 pounds of propellant, 110 pounds of oxygen, 926 pounds of water, and 2,778 pounds of dry cargo. That dry cargo includes maintenance hardware, resupply items, life support system items, and experiment equipment to ensure that the International Space Station and this Expedition 30 crew are properly supplied. All launch conditions were nominal, and again, place the progress into its low Earth orbit trajectory back on Wednesday evening. And all of that, again, set us up for tonight's docking activities with the scheduled docking just over 35 minutes away. If a laptop has reloaded, uh, no, we, it, we have not bring it up yet. What are you going to do? Currently, two other spacecraft are docked with the International Space Station. And so we are getting the TV image on a different Channel. This Progress 46 will be the third. Here on your screen, you can see them, the Soyuz 29 or TMA-03M spacecraft, which carried Pettit, Kuipers, and Kononenko to the station, is currently docked at the Rosviet module, which is the nadir-facing port or earth-facing port on the Russian Zarya module. At the top, kind of out of view, is the Soyuz 28 or TMA-22, which carried Commander Burbank, Anton Shkaflov, and Anatoly Ivanishin, and is docked with the Poisk module, which is the zenith or space-facing port on the Zvezda service module. The Progress 46 will be docking with the Piers module 
there you can see, and that is the nadir facing port of the Zvezda service module. And again, just a little over half an hour away as we await for this Progress spacecraft. It is fully automated, being controlled by the core's antenna system. I can see and just now coming into view on the station's outboard cameras, you can see in the bottom left that Progress spacecraft closing in. It will dock just after 6 p.m. Central Time today, delivering that to those 2.9 tons of supplies to the station. This is a view from the Progress camera. How copy? If you look in the lower left corner of your screen, you can see two values, the first of which, that 2.434, shows the progress at a range of about 2.4 kilometers and closing from the station. Below that is the rate of closure, currently at about 5.5 meters per second. By the time it's just about to dock and capture with the station, that will sl slow to a sloth-like rate of only a tenth of a meter per second. Activate Soro. Uh, go to page. And again, this entire docking is done automatically by the Coors rendezvous system. But meanwhile, Russian cosmonauts Anton Shkaplerov and Oleg Konyenko are standing by in the Zvezda service module, monitoring the progress docking and talking to controllers on the ground, ensuring that everything is performing normally, and also standing by at the TORU controls. TORU is the tele-robotically operated rendezvous system, which is a control board on board the station that serves as a backup system should the astronauts need to take over manual control of the spacecraft in the event of any malfunction of that core's automatic system. have been depressed. Yes. We have verified all the buttons, all the keys. I have been depressed. So we are powering it up. Copy. Shkaplarov and Kononenko going through the stages of powering up that TORU system and making sure it is again on standby just in case a manual control override is necessary. Currently less than two kilometers away, the progress on its approach will reach a final targeting point, at which point small thrusters will begin firing on board the spacecraft to maneuver it into a fly around, which will bring it into an eventual lineup with the docking cone of that pier's compartment. Uh, and the Following this final alignment, a period of station keeping will occur where Russian ground controllers confirm that they are happy with the alignment before beginning the final approach, which again will end at a closure rate of only one-tenth of a meter per second. Initial configuration copy. Following the final capture, and one stocking is confirmed. A few minutes of time will pass as the relative motion of the two vehicles is allowed to dampen and ensure that they are properly mated. Then following this period, a, the forward docking probe will retract and, and after that a hard mate will have occurred. This will allow a series of hooks and latches to engage, firmly attaching the Progress spacecraft to the International Space Station. To the next test, which is the attitude control. So the roll. So the station currently flying towards the Southern Pacific Ocean. And again, we are just now 30 minutes away from the eventual docking. And then we're going clockwise. We are getting the indicators. In neutral, and now the light is off. Pitch. Yes. We are receiving the indicators. Neutral. Our progress TV camera showing only 1.2 kilometers away. I'm getting the indication for all four. The rate of closure will slowly decrease over time, approaching just four meters per second. Going to the left. 
We are receiving the indication. They are on. Now neutral. The indication is off. To the right, the light indicators are on, neutral, off, and down. Up. In this a view of the cavernous mission control center over in Koryov, Russia. All four are lit up. As they continue to monitor the systems and the telemetry data coming down from that Progress 46 spacecraft. All three are on. Everything being reported nominal so far as it continues to close in to its ultimate docking location on the pier's compartment. Slowing down, all four are on. The neutral is off. Acceleration, all four are on. Neutral are off. Now, going back to the operational initial, Bekaes Beves. Better view of the progress as it gets closer. Off. You can see the solar arrays deployed, powering the vehicle as it makes its orbits around the planet. Complete. Now let's go to page 23. Item 4.3. Step 4.3. Copy. And we are seeing the space station. Okay, you have a go to perform the steps uh, for the automated uh, rendezvous. Copy. Range is 750, and the range rate is minus 286. Copy. Uh, Anton, now we are going to perform some steps so we can see see the uh, station better. Uh, did you say we are going to lift it up? Yes. Uh, we will be uh, performing the step and then we'll be activating the lights. Okay, now the lights. So as the progress continues to close, it is just under 700 meters away from the station, about five minutes away from that fly around maneuver that will bring it into an ultimate alignment pattern. The display that is better for you. Are you seeing this? Visiting vehicle officer here in Mission Control reporting that the crew has completed their nominal checkout of the TORU system. Again, that is the telerobotically operated rendezvous system on board the station, currently manned by Anton Shkaplerov and Anna, correction, Oleg Kononenko. And that is the manual backup system should the core's automated rendezvous system malfunction for any reason. So as we're under five minutes away from this initiation of the fly around and final alignment of the progress with the piers docking compartment, following that fly around, a period of station keeping will occur where Russian controllers on the ground make sure that they're happy with the alignment before giving the final initiation to commence with docking. Range is 500, uh, range rate is minus 1.7, copy, and the space station is in the middle. And we can see progress in window 6, copy. Now under 500 meters away from docking with the International Space Station. The range is 500, and the range rate is minus 1.52. The space station is in the center. Copy. Station currently flying over the southern Pacific Ocean. As you can see, the progress continuing to close. Now under 500 meters away. Minus 135. Antennas have been activated.
So just under 400 meters away, the progress again. Just a minute or two away from beginning that fly around to ultimately line it up with the pier's docking compartment on these VESDA service module. Following this fly around, we'll stand by for a few minutes of station keeping while Russian controllers in Koryov monitor all of the telemetry and ensure that the progress is pro properly aligned before giving the final initiation for docking. During that final docking maneuver, when the progress is about 50 meters away, the KERS automa automated rendezvous system antenna will retract and computers on board the progress will automatically commence the final stages of docking. So as the station continues to fly over the southern Pacific Ocean, progress coming into view now on the outboard station cameras. And the visiting vehicle officer here in Mission Control Houston Range has confirmed that the fly around mode of the progress spacecraft has commenced. Again, this fly around, a number of small thrusters on board the spacecraft will fly it around the station and align it with that pier's docking compartment, putting the progress in its final position for its straightaway docking to the International Space Station. Once this fly around is complete, controllers in Koryov will monitor the systems and ensure that they have a good alignment before giving the final go for docking. Uh, we continue the fly around. As you can see in the bottom left of your screen, the progress rate of closure is slowed to less than a meter per second, moving at a speed of about eight tenths of a meter per second in relation to the International Space Station, just over 300 meters away. You can see on the progress spacecraft the small thrusters firing, maneuvering it around into that station keeping position. Ranger is uh, 300, range rate is minus 0 0.70, and the station is close to being in the center, copy, in the center, copy. All progress systems continuing to perform nominally as the fly around commences. Now under 300 meters away and closing at a rate just over half a meter per second. And I confirm the using the angular velocity equipment that the range is 270. Copy. So once this fly around is complete and station keeping is finished, the Progress spacecraft will commence its final docking procedure, flying into the pier's compartment and conducting a soft mate capture with the docking cone. Following this soft capture, a number of minutes will pass while the relative motion of both the Progress and the International Space Station dampen out before the forward docking probe is retracted to perform a hard mate. Then a series of, of latches and hooks will enable, and that will complete a hard mate, ensuring that the progress is firmly docked to the International Space Station.
I can see a roll maneuver. Copy. Range rate is 237, and range rate is minus 0 0.3. Copy. So as the Progress spacecraft is moving at just about a third of a meter per second closing. It's commencing a roll maneuver to align its solar arrays for final docking procedures. And we are just a few minutes away from station keeping. You can see the thrusters on the top part of the Progress spacecraft continuing to fire as it performs this roll maneuver. And the visiting vehicle officer here in Mission Control Houston confirms that station keeping has begun. So the Russian controllers in Koryov, Russia, will take a few minutes to check the telemetry being downlinked from the Progress spacecraft and ensure that it is in the proper alignment to commence with docking. see the piers docking compartment coming into the center of your screen there as the progress's crosshair continues to line up. Range rate is minus 0 0.1. Copy. And the vehicle is at the docking assembly axis. Copy. This is a reminder that uh, the fly, uh, the station keeping, keeping will last for about seven uh, minutes. Uh, copy, and we are going to close the shutter for window nine. Copy. So as station keeping continues and controllers in Koryov monitor the telemetry and ensure that progress is in its proper alignment. The visiting vehicle officer here in Mission Control confirms that the final approach command should be given on schedule at 5.58 p.m. Central Time. After that command is given, about a 10-minute final approach for the progress will occur as it targets that pier's docking compartment on the Earth-facing side of the Zvezda service module. Again, just about five minutes away from the end of this station keeping period. The orbiting complex and the progress currently over the southern Atlantic Ocean at an altitude just under 250 statute miles. And we are monitoring the station keeping. The range is 195. The range rate is minus 0 0.05. And we are opposite the DC-1. So flight controllers in Koryov are continuing to monitor the alignment of the forward docking probe on the Progress spacecraft, ensuring that it is correctly lined up and pointing at that pier's docking compartment. Also on your screen you can see a number of other items. Those folded up accordion-like structures are solar arrays that were used and are attached to the Zarya module, which was the original Russian module launched and the first part of the International Space Station. 
Those are no longer in use as a number of solar arrays have been since attached, providing the rest of the station's power. And here a view of that Progress 46 spacecraft, again packed with about 2.9 tons of food, fuel, and supplies for the members of Expedition 30 currently on board the International Space Station. ISS Moscow. ISS Moscow. Again, this is the Russian flight control room in Koryov, Russia, where they are wrapping up the final moments of the station keeping exercise. And while they continue to track the station, it's approaching the Chilean coast in southern South Africa, moving from a southwest to northeasterly coast. If all goes as planned with tonight's docking, it, the final capture will occur just off the eastern coast of Brazil. The rate is minus zero. As the station is currently moving into an orbital sunset. The front pairs of the docking assembly on DC-1, and uh, we are looking at the display 44, and we get all the right indicators. Copy. And again, just about a minute away from the end of this station keeping period. ISS Moscow, how are things? Everything is nominal. Uh, we see the final approach on display 44. The vehicle is opposite the DC-1 docking assembly. And we are also receiving the video now. We've resumed receiving it. Sunset. And the visiting vehicle officer here in Mission Control confirms that the final approach command has been given. Range is 190 and uh, close. The progress is now beginning to close with its final location being that Piers docking compartment on the earth facing side of the Vesta service module. Copy. Anton, please. With this command being given, we're now about 10 minutes away from soft capture. Different AJC mode. Uh, select operation first and go ahead and uh, select different AJC mode. Copy and work. Operation mode set. AJC mode. Selection and work. And you may keep going, Anton, a little bit more. One more time, Anton. Range is 150. Range rate is minus zero decimal 86. I have a good visual on the docking port. Operation deactive mode deactivation. LEDs are off. Range is 130. Closing rate is zero decimal sixty eight. Copy. Three 
Думаю, четыре ориентировочно войдем. At three zero four, approximately, we're going to have sunset. So we're going to enter eclipse. And right before you enter eclipse, you will need to deactivate it. Just see. Copy prior to entering eclipse. Deactivate. Or disable. AJC mode. And uh, we are going to enter Eclipse in about five minutes. Copy. Eclipse in five minutes. Uh, range currently is 107. Range rate is 0 0.53. Copy. This is a view from one of the external cameras on board the station, moving at a rate just under half a meter per second now, and about seven minutes away from docking. And the target is uh, near the call center. Update. Do not disable AGC mode upon entering Eclipse, but rather I disable it uh, when you receive the third square in the upper right corner. Okay, say that again? Oh, I copy, I see. Right, so uh, activate operation mode, then select a different AGC mode, and then wait until a third square in the upper right hand corner Appears. Copy. Operation mode set. AGC selected. Third square is received and uh, the uh, image quality is a little worse. And because of this AGC mode, I do not see the crosshairs at this time. What are real recommendations? The range is 60 now, range rate 0 decimal 26. Okay, uh, it's uh, at your discretion, Anton. Uh, go ahead and select whatever AGC mode uh, that uh, you find easier to work with. Copy and work. Selecting AGC. As the Progress 46 approaches that 50 meter mark, the CURS, correction, CORS automated rendezvous system antenna should be retracting momentarily. Uh, 55, range rate is 0 decimal 20. Should uh, I continue to uh, have the uh, operation mode set? No, go ahead and disable operation mode. Copy. The visiting vehicle officer here in Mission Control reporting the range is officially at 50 meters. And the target is in the center. Copy. Do you have a clear visual on the target, Anton? I see the crosshairs. Copy. Range is 45. Range rate is uh, 0.19. Copy. The crosshairs are within 1. And the visiting vehicle officer confirms that the CORS antenna has been retracted. Computer systems on board the Progress now in an automated fly-in for the remainder of the docking. Station. The docking crosshair underneath the pier's compartment coming into a good view now. You can see it there. As the systems on board the Progress will use that as an alignment destination. Listen, Anton, be advised that you should see a little bit of a vibration. Copy.
Mission the target is near the center of the VACO. Range is 30. Range rate is 0 decimal 14. Range is 30. Range rate is 0 decimal 1.5. And the crosshairs is aligned. Progress just under 30 meters away. The station complex currently orbiting about 240 miles over the Earth, just to the southeast of Brazil. Twenty-five meters range. Range rate zero decimal eleven. Copy. I have a good visual on the target, and the crosshairs are within the center, right in the center, and the target is within one square around the center. SSVP ready. Is set. What about OVACA antenna? And I see the antenna is retracted. 20 meters, range rate 0 decimal 13. Copy. A little bit of a roll. Moscow station, I think that the floodlight on the progress turned off. We don't see it. The target is within one square. Copy. Range is 17. Copy 17 for range. The target is uh, one square to the right. A little bit of a roll up to five degrees. Copy. Target center is getting closer to the VKU center. Just 10 meters away now from the Progress 46 docking with the International Space Station. Crosshair doing some fine-tuning maneuvers to get it right there in the center. Range is about 7. Everything continues to be nominal. Copy. The center of the crosshairs is um, about half a square to the right, and it's trending up. Range is about five meters now. We copy, Anton. So just about five meters away, flight controllers are now standing by for confirmation of contact and capture. Closer to the center. Range is about three. Copy. Crosshairs and VECO center are aligned. Copy. Getting closer to one meter mark. One meter. Concur. Everything's nominal. Contact. Copy contact. And we have contact and capture of the Progress 46 resupply craft with the International Space Station. Well, Anton. Thank you. And everything is nominal. Copy. And uh, this is Moscow. Confirm capture. Contact and capture occurring officially at 6.09 p.m. Central Time, just off the northeastern coast of Brazil. We also confirm capture on the station.
and as mentioned prior, a period now will pass as they wait for the relative motion of these two vehicles to dampen out. Then following that, the forward docking probe will be retracted to perform a hard mate, allowing for the hooks and latches to close, firmly securing the Progress spacecraft to the International Space Station. So again, that docking and capture confirmed at 6.09 p.m. Central Time today of this Progress 46 spacecraft, bringing an end to a two-day journey that began back on Wednesday. Standing by for a year ago to deactivate Toro per page 27 of the Toro RDF step 4.5. Copy, Anton. Congratulations on uh, a successful progress docking, Anton, and uh, we're going to continue uh, the hard mate process until uh, it com it's over, and then uh, we'll go to page 27 and perform Toro deactivation. Copy, standing by for your go, and uh, likewise, congratulations. The Russian ground control team and the astronauts congratulating each other on a successful progress docking tonight. They are currently in the process of finishing up, waiting for the dampening of the motion between these vehicles before they perform the hard mate. And you can see here the configuration now of the International Space Station with the two Soyuz vehicles having already been there. The Progress 46 in the lower right of your screen docked to the International Space Station at the Piers docking compartment. That is on the Earth-facing side of the Zvezda service module. The Progress delivering 2.9 tons of food, fuel, and cargo to the crew members of Expedition 30. In that cargo, we have about 2,050 pounds of propellant, 110 pounds of oxygen, 926 pounds of water, and 2,778 pounds of dry cargo, including maintenance hardware, resupply items, life support system, and experiment equipment. This progress launched back on Wednesday from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, and tonight's activities bring an end to its two-day journey to the International Space Station. That period of motion dampening is now passed and the hooks and latches are being initiated. And once that is completed and the forward docking probe is retracted, a hard mate will be completed between the progress and the space station.
Meterhoher Schnee, eisiger Sturm, frostige Temperaturen. Der Winter hat Osteuropa fest im Griff. In Bulgarien erfror ein Mann auf der Straße. In Serbien ist der Katastrophenschutz pausenlos im Einsatz, um Menschen in warme Unterkünfte zu bringen. Womit der Osten schon zu kämpfen hat, das droht Deutschland in der nächsten Woche. Die Temperaturen gehen drastisch runter. Erste Ausläufer sind schon jetzt zu spüren. Das Wetter wurde dem Fahrer eines Sattelzugs in der Nacht auf der A37 zum Verhängnis. Die Straßenverhältnisse sind zum Teil sehr glatt, äh, aufgrund des Schneefalls, der vorherrschte. Und äh, nach Aussagen der Polizei äh, liegt die Vermutung nahe, dass es sich hierbei auch um diesen Glätteumfall handelt. Bei Hannover war das Fahrzeug ins Schleudern geraten, hatte sich um die eigene Achse gedreht und war weggerutscht. Dabei walzte der Lkw die Leitplanke nieder und touchierte die Lärmschutzwand. Der Fahrer kam mit dem Schrecken davon. Doch immer hat der Winter auch schöne Seiten und so genießen die Kinder in Hamburg die erste Schneewaldschlacht. Endlich. Auch im Westen geht es jetzt den letzten Resten der milderen Luft an den Kragen. Denn in den nächsten Tagen stellt sich eine richtig kalte Wetterlage ein. Ausgehend von einem kräftigen Russland hoch dreht unsere Strömung überall auf Ost bis Südost. Und damit gibt es eben trockenkaltes Winterwetter. Und somit geht es nach einem zunehmend kalten Wochenende auch frostig in die neue Woche. Verbreitet liegen die Temperaturen am Montag früh zwischen minus 10 und minus 3 Grad, stellenweise aber auch noch darunter. Und auch tagsüber sind nur noch Temperaturen um um den Gefrierpunkt möglich, die sich durch den eisigen Ostwind nochmals deutlich kälter anfühlen. Er kam über Nacht und das gleich heftig. Der Wintereinbruch führte besonders im Norden zu rutschigen Wegen und glatten Straßen. Die Winterdienste wie hier in Hamburg mussten mit einem Großaufgebot ausrücken. Wir haben äh, 1000 Einsatzkräfte zur Verfügung gehabt, bis zu 270 Fahrzeuge. Und heute Nacht um zwei haben wir dann auch Alarm ausgelöst. Dennoch kam es allein im Norden zu Hunderten von Unfällen. Dieser Laster kam auf der A37 bei Hannover ins Rutschen, drehte sich und schleuderte in die Leitplanken. Der Fahrer blieb unverletzt. Im Thüringer Wald mussten erste Dächer von Eis und Schnee befreit werden. Nach wochenlangem Schneemangel gibt es den jetzt im Überfluss. Also das Schönste am Winter ist, wenn man vorbei ist. Dabei können viele gar nicht genug von ihm bekommen. Hier am höchsten Berg Deutschlands etwa. Hier ist es allerdings schon länger weiß, mehr noch rekordweiß. Fast fünf Meter Schnee liegen derzeit auf der Zugspitze. Man kann das ganz gut sehen hier drüben an dieser Markierung. Normalerweise kommen diese Schneemengen erst zusammen bis zum Ende der Saison, also bis Ende April. Österreich ächzt bereits unter Schneemassen von rund zwei Metern in den Tälern. Erst der Schnee, jetzt die Kälte. Verantwortlich dafür ist das Kältehoch Cooper, das ab dem Wochenende Frost über ganz Deutschland legt. Einen Vorgeschmack auf fast sibirische Verhältnisse bekommt jetzt schon der Südosten Europas. Auf dem Balkan fielen stellenweise bis zu drei Metern Schnee. Viele Autos blieben in Schneewehen stecken. In Rumänien mussten zahlreiche Flüge gestrichen werden. In Serbien und anderen Ländern wurde sogar der Notstand ausgerufen. Right there in the middle of France, you can see the first snowfall of the season here and frigid temperatures. And even as we head into the UK, old man winter is making a comeback and it's been pretty harsh indeed. Um, temperatures will be uh, barely making it out of freezing in London and in Paris over the next few days. Decidedly, though, the coldest air is still across Eastern Europe. Look at some of these uh, temperatures. It's minus six in Berlin right now. It's a minus 19 in Moscow. They are uh, woke up with temperatures that were closer to minus 27. And that's das ist, was es fühlt sich jetzt in Moskau, wenn du in den Wind Der Wind wird etwas sehr Signifikantes sein. Es fühlt sich wie minus 29. Wow. Wenn du jetzt über die Temperaturen sprichst, die in diesem Range sind, in den 20s, wie du es jetzt fühlst, wie du es in Warsaw fühlst, like in, Warsaw, for example, in Kiew, um, was passiert ist, dein Körper, dein Skin kann literally freeze in uh, 30 Minuten oder less. Sometimes in as little as 10 Minuten, depending on the condition of the person, how much, uh, uh, how much, uh, uh, how long they've been outside, what they're wearing, what they've eaten, and also the age. So this is very significant, and they're having to deal with this across this entire region. Notice southeastern Europe also dealing with extremely uh, cold temperatures, and guess what? More snow is on the way across this entire region. So France, Italy and back over all the way down into Greece and even into Turkey. Back to you. 
Aus Kanada haben eine Lego-Figur ins Weltall geschickt. Mit einem Heliumballon Helium über dem Kopf, einer kanadischen Flagge in der Hand und einer Digitalkamera ging es 24 Kilometer in die Höhe. Zwar beginnt hier offiziell noch nicht der Weltraum, aber die Erdkrümmung ist aus der Stratosphäre schon deutlich zu sehen. Zwei Jahre bauten die Jungs an ihrem Lego-Nauten und investierten umgerechnet rund 300 Euro. Nach anderthalbstündiger Reise hat das Männchen dann den Weg zurück zur Erde gefunden. Stoff im gekenterten Kreuzfahrtschiff Costa Concordia vor der italienischen Küste bleibt vorerst in den Tanks. Wegen des schlechten Wetters mussten die für heute geplanten Abpumparbeiten verschoben werden. Die Suche nach Opfern der Schiffskatastrophe ging trotzdem weiter. Dabei fanden Taucher eine weitere Leiche im Rumpf des Schiffes. Mehr von Mario Turic. Diesmal waren sie ganz tief hinabgetaucht, Deck Nummer 6 im überfluteten Bereich der Costa Concordia. Das jüngste Opfer, eine Frau, trug keine Schwimmweste. Die Zahl der Toten des Schiffsunglücks stieg damit auf 17. Das Auswärtige Amt in Berlin bestätigte heute ein fünftes deutsches Opfer unter den bisher geborgenen Leichen. Während die Taucher weiter nach noch 17 Vermissten suchen, wurden die Arbeiten unterbrochen, die notwendig sind, um den Treibstoff aus dem Unglücksschiff zu pumpen. Einige der Tanks liegen in einer Tiefe von etwa 35 bis 40 Meter und das Schiff liegt in einem ungünstigen Winkelaufgrund. Für unsere Taucher ist es derzeit heikel, die nötige Vorrichtung zum Abpumpen exakt anzubringen. Möglicherweise verzögert sich das Abpumpen des Treibstoffs bis Mitte kommender Woche. Wegen der höheren Wellen heute musste eine für die Arbeiten wichtige Plattform vom Schiff weg und in den Hafen von Giglio geschleppt werden. Dort auf der Insel werden auch an diesem Wochenende wieder viele Schaulustige vom Festland erwartet. Wir haben wieder geöffnet, obwohl zu dieser Jahreszeit bei uns alles im Winterschlaf ist. Jetzt haben wir Arbeit, wir wollen den Menschen hier schließlich etwas anbieten können. Aber wir hätten gerne darauf verzichtet, schließlich bleibt das alles ein schreckliches Ereignis. Das fanden noch sechs Passagiere der Costa Concordia und reichten deshalb eine weitere Schadensersatzklage in den USA ein, am Sitz des Schiffseigners. Ihre Forderung fast 348 Millionen Euro. Die Suche nach Opfern im Wrack der Costa Concordia ist heute offiziell beendet worden. Den Verwandten der noch vermissten Passagiere und Crewmitglieder wurde diese Entscheidung am Mittag mitgeteilt. Grund für den Abbruch der Suchaktion seien schlechte Wetterbedingungen, die die Sicherheit der Taucher gefährden. 17 Opfer wurden bisher geborgen, darunter sechs Deutsche. Insgesamt 16 Passagiere und Crewmitglieder werden noch vermisst. Knapp drei Wochen nach der Havarie der Costa Concordia stellen die Rettungskräfte ihre Suche nach Vermissten weitgehend ein. Die Gefahr für die Taucher ist zu groß, daher werden sie im überfluteten Schiffsteil nicht mehr eingesetzt. Aus dem Wrack wurden insgesamt 17 Tote geborgen, darunter sechs Deutsche. 15 Menschen werden noch vermisst. Sie sollen jetzt nur noch im Schiffsteil über Wasser und rund um das Schiff gesucht werden. So langsam wird Deutschland zur Gefriertruhe. Auch tagsüber bleiben die Temperaturen bei uns jetzt unter 0 Grad. Die Oder ist wegen des frostigen Wetters seit heute für die Schifffahrt gesperrt. Und die ersten Seen frieren zu. Doch die Feuerwehr warnt, meist ist die Eisdecke noch nicht tragfähig. Das Betreten lebensgefährlich. Jonas Gerdes mit Einzelheiten. Mit einem Seil gelang schließlich die Rettung eines Eisseglers aus dem Wandlitzer See im Norden Berlins. Auch ein Anwohner und zwei Rettungskräfte brachen durch die Eisdecke. Sie ist einfach noch zu dünn. Genau wie der Eissegler selbst kamen auch die Retter mit starken Unterkühlungen ins Krankenhaus. Etwa 13 cm Dicke braucht Eis, um Menschen zu tragen. Und dazu muss es noch mindestens eine Woche so kalt bleiben. Wir warnen eindringlichst vor dem Betreten von zugefrorenen Seen, Teichen oder Tümpel. Es ist eine trügerische Sicherheit, wenn man die Eisfläche sieht. Es ist der Weg in den Tod. Aus diesem äh, Wasser kommt man ganz schwer von alleine wieder raus. Am kältesten war es bisher im Osten der Republik. Am frühen Morgen wurden hier in Aschersleben in Sachsen-Anhalt minus 16 Grad gemessen. In Erfurt zeigte das Thermometer minus 12. Die Hauptstadt zitterte bei minus 11 Grad. Darüber können die Bewohner des kältesten bewohnten Ortes der Erde nur müde lächeln. Aus dem sibirischen Eumjakon kommt unsere Kälte. In einem der vergangenen Winter war unser Reporter vor Ort. Derzeit sind es dort bis zu minus 54 Grad. Bei diesen Temperaturen wird mein Hemd, welches wir vor zehn Minuten ausgehängt haben, ziemlich schnell zu einer Art Knäckebrot. Man kann es knicken und zerreißen. 
Auch Lebensmittel gefrieren auf der Stelle. Brot wird so hart, dass man es sogar als Hammer nutzen kann. So eisig wird es in Deutschland natürlich nie. Doch auch denen, die hier keinen Platz im Warmen finden, muss geholfen werden. In der Oase in Leipzig gibt es Abendbrot und Betten für Obdachlose. Autobesitzer sollten sich mit Frostschutzmittel eindecken und die Batterie checken lassen. Denn bis zum Wochenende wird es noch immer kälter. Tag 2 der kleinen Kältewelle und der Ostfrost trägt seinen Namen zurecht, denn im Osten blieb es auch tagsüber ziemlich eisig, während in Köln heute die letzten Plusgrade für längere Zeit gemessen wurden. Da zum Ostfrost auch Ostwind kommt, war die gefühlte Kälte bereits oft zweistellig am Brocken minus 25 Grad. Und auch optisch gibt es einmal Kälte bei wenig Wind, hier eine Kirche aus Schnee und Eis im tiefsten bayerischen Wald und einmal die Kälte der Marke Sibirien. Bei diesen Bildern wird klar, was die Metrologen mit windexpolierten Lagen meinen. Genau das, irgendwo in der Pampa mit einem Windrad drauf. Das Kältezentrum liegt derzeit nördlich des Kaspischen Meeres, erreicht morgen Moskau und nimmt dann Kurs Richtung Ostsee. Am Wochenende zerbröselt es zwar, es kommt aber immer noch genug Kälte bei uns an. Das zeigt auch die Wolkenanimation in der klaren Kaltluft, morgen wieder viel Sonne. Nur dort, wo die arktische Luft über die Ostsee daherkommt, bilden sich Wolken und später in einem schmalen Streifen an der Küste teils kräftige Schneeschauer. Die kommende Nacht aber noch meist klar, mit Frost im Osten bis minus 18 Grad, auch im Westen kalt mit eisigem Ostwind, im Südwesten Hochnebel, aus dem ein paar Flocken fallen. Morgen Mittwoch, abgesehen vom äußersten Süden, wieder viel Sonne, später auch von der Ostsee her dichte Wolken und erste Schneeschauer. Temperaturen überall im Dauerfrostbereich bei minus 1 bis minus 11 Grad. Am Donnerstag schweinekalt, aber schön sonnig, nur an der Küste Schneeschauer. Am Freitag und Samstag aus Norden dann mehr Wolken und ein paar Flocken. Dazu noch eisiger nachts bis unter minus 20 Grad. Der Winter bleibt. Good morning and welcome from Mission Control Houston and for join us, joining us today for the International Space Station Update Hour. Getting a look now inside as ground personnel in Houston, Texas monitor systems on board the orbiting laboratory. Currently on console, the Orbit 2 team is hard at work and they are being led today by Flight Director Emily Nelson. They are supporting the crew of Expedition 30, currently orbiting on the International Space Station, just passing over Baja, California a few moments ago and continuing down the western coast of Mexico. That crew on board again is Expedition 30 and they are being led by NASA astronaut and Commander Dan Burbank there in the front row left of your screen. And then joining him also in the front row is Russian cosmonaut Oleg Kononenko. And then across the back row starting in the left are Russian cosmonauts Anton Shkaplerov and Anatoly Ivanishin. They are joined by European Space Agency astronaut Andre Kuipers, and then finally rounding out the crew on the right is NASA astronaut Don Pettit. The crew woke up at about midnight central time today for another off-duty day as they are recovering from a vigorous weekend where they were unloading cargo from that recently docked Progress 46 vehicle, which arrived at the station late, when, wait, late Friday evening at 6.09 p.m. Central Time. The crew has just a few activities scheduled on their timeline for each one. Commander Burbank doing some work with the integrated cardiovascular monitoring system alongside with Don Pettit, who is doing some data downloads from his, so Commander Burbank there. Burbank also did a reaction self-test uh, upon waking today, which is a quick five-minute test that allows crew members to monitor the daily effects of any fatigue due to performance on board the station. Anton Shkaplerov is working today with the Immuno experiment, a Russian research look at determining changes in stress and immune responses during these long duration stays on board the station. He is also participating in a Russian public affairs event with Russian television stations and joining him will be Russian cosmonauts Anatoly Ivanishin and Olag Kanyenko. Ivanishin also today will be doing some laptop software refresh work, looking at some of the antivirus software on one of those computers in the Russian segment. And then the final Russian cosmonaut Olag Kanyenko will also be doing some routine coolant maintenance. European astronaut Andrei Kuipers 
major activity for the day will be setting up the Earth Knowledge Acquired by Middle School Students WARF camera, WARF standing for the Window Observational Research Facility. That is an educational experiment that allows students on the ground to actively participate in space-based research. And the final crew member of Expedition 30, Don Pettit, again, is doing some work with the Integrated Cardiovascular System, which is a research study that looks at heart atrophy due to the microgravity environment on board the International Space Station. He's doing some data downloads to controllers here on the ground. After all of this, the crew will be scheduled to go to sleep at about 3.30 p.m. Central Time today, bringing a close to an off-duty day, again following a vigorous unloading activity following that Progress 46 dock that took place last Friday. Good morning from Mission Control Houston and welcome to today's International Space Station Update Hour. Joining us now in the flight control room here in Houston, Texas as the Orbit 2 team is on console monitoring systems on board the orbiting laboratory. Today's team is being led by Flight Director Emily Nelson and joining her will be Capcom Rob Hayhurst serving as the voice connection between controllers here on the ground and the astronauts up in space. And those astronauts right now are the crew of Expedition 30 and they are being led by NASA astronaut and Commander Dan Burbank there in the front left of your screen. And also in the front row joining him is Russian cosmonaut Alag Kononenko. And then along the back row, we have Russian cosmonauts Anton Shkaplerov and Anatoly Ivanishin, European Space Agency astronaut Andrei Koivers, and NASA astronaut Don Pettit. The crew awoke at about midnight central time today and then got right into some very busy work with a number of experiments and maintenance activities going on today. Starting out, we have Commander Burbank who began his day doing some of the treadmill kinematics exercises. This is a research study into determining the most beneficial treadmill exercise conditions for these astronauts in order to maintain and improve their crew member health. He's also doing a number of experiment works today with the binary colloidal alloy test, or the BCAT system which is a very complicated procedure that uses microscopic particles known as colloids as models for studying the fundamental physics of the liquid crystal phase. Meanwhile, Russian cosmonaut Anton Shkaplerov did some work today on the immuno experiment taking blood and saliva samples. This research looks to determine changes in stress and immune responses both during and after a stay for these astronauts on board the International Space Station. He is also doing some unloading work on that Progress 46 spacecraft, which docked last Friday. Russian cosmonaut Anatoly Ivanishin assisted on that immuno experiment earlier this morning and is involved in a number of maintenance activities on the Russian segment, working on the Russian toilet, the electron system, which helps to generate some of the oxygen on board the station, and also doing a window inspection on the piers and Poisk docking modules. The third and final Russian cosmonaut, Oleg Kononenko, is replacing a support panel in Poisk and taking a look and testing out the control panel in piers. And this is all being done in preparation for an upcoming Russian EVA or spacewalk scheduled to take place February 16th that will be with Kononenko and Shikoplerov. European, European Space Agency astronaut Andre Kuipers is working with the water resource system, doing some transfer work and cleaning it out, and also doing some replacement work in one of the human research facilities, working on the pulmonary function system. That system hopes to helps to determine the concentration of different respired gas components and is a ongoing research tool for studying respiratory and cardiovascular measurements. And our final member of Expedition 30, Don Pettit, did a lot of work today with the capillary flow experiments. These are some very interesting fluid experiments that go on in that microgravity environment that help to investigate capillary flows and the flows of different fluids in containers with very complex geometries. And then results from this will help improve models used by designers for low gravity fluid systems and will help improve fluid transfer systems on future spacecrafts.
Welche Musik hört der Mann im Mond? Unsere Generation ist verrückt nach dem Mond. Wie erkannt Méliès Film, ohne seinen Namen zu wissen? Der Filmpionier Georges Méliès. 1902 drehte er seine Reise zum Mond mit einer selbst gebastelten Kamera. Das Resultat? Der erste Blockbuster der Filmgeschichte. In einer schwarz-weißen und in einer handkolorierten Farbversion. Die Farbversion geriet jedoch fast genauso schnell in Vergessenheit wie Georges Méliès. Und jetzt ist er wieder da. 16 Minuten fremde Welten, Abenteuer, unendliche Weiten und dazu eine neu komponierte Musik. Als Méliès seinen Film gemacht hat, wollte er das Publikum unterhalten. Aber im Laufe der Zeit wurde aus dem Film ein Museumsstück. Wir fanden das deprimierend, denn das war nicht, was Méliès für seinen Film gewollt hätte. Deshalb haben wir versucht, eine Musik zu komponieren, die den Visionen von Méliès gerecht wird, etwas zu schaffen, was man sich auch heute voller Begeisterung ansieht. Die Zwei-Mann-Band Air. Elektrolegenden aus Frankreich. Modern und immer irgendwie zeitlos. Wie Méliès Reise zum Mond. Er gab der Weltenreise einen neuen Klang. Er sind Spezialisten für sphärische Klänge und hatten schon immer ein Gefühl für schwer greifbare Sterne. Besonders wichtig ist es, sich den Film in Farbe anzuschauen. Wenn man ihn in Farbe sieht, wechselt man in eine andere Dimension. Wenn man ihn in Schwarz-Weiß anschaut, fühlt man sich anders. Jetzt fühlt er sich psychedelisch an, deshalb haben wir eine psychedelische Musik dazu komponiert. Wäre der Film in Schwarz-Weiß, hätten wir eine vollkommen andere Musik geschrieben. Es war eine Sensation für die Filmwelt. 1993 tauchte die fast zerstörte farbige Filmrolle bei einem Sammler in Spanien auf. Jetzt erscheint sie in neuem Glanz oder aufwendig restauriert. Über 13.000 kolorierte Einzelbilder. 13.000 digital aufbereitete Magic Mushrooms. Mit der Musik von Air wird der Zuschauer des neuen Jahrtausends zum Glückspilz. Ein opulenter Sinnenrausch, ein buntes Spektakel, eine fremde Welt aus ferner Zeit, 110 Jahre alt. Und der Film hat durch die Musik der Gegenwart seine Seele nicht verloren. Wenn jemand 1902 eine Filmmusik komponiert hätte, dann hätten wir den Auftrag niemals angenommen. Denn wir wollen niemanden verraten oder etwas ersetzen. Méliès hat den Film vor langer Zeit gemacht. Er wusste nicht, dass er nur ein halbes Kunstwerk geschaffen hat. Er konnte nicht ahnen, dass irgendwann alle Filme Ton haben würden. Falls irgendwann eine andere Band eine Musik für den Film schreibt, tritt er wieder ins Bewusstsein. Das ist eine wunderbare Chance, denn er wird immer ein unvollendetes Kunstwerk bleiben, an dem man immer weiterarbeiten kann. Der Mann im Mond kann zufrieden sein. Endlich ist hier mal wieder was los. Und wenn er mal wieder allein sein sollte kann er sich nicht nur an seinen neuen Bildern berauschen. <Sie>